if she does become necessary, to, or she, is it is it if it is necessary for her to be testifying, then we'll put her under oath. Thank uh, you, but Mr. we do Chair. have a member of the campaign finance board here to ask any questions that might come up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff from not a member of campaign finance board, but a staff member. Um, any additional questions on where we're going today for members? Not seeing any, so uh, we'll begin uh, with uh, Senator Coran. If you have any additional questions or discussion points you'd like to make, then we'll go to uh, Senator Fatay and his counsel, then we'll come back to the panel for additional discussion on count number one. Thank Senator you, Mr. Curran. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And in, in, re, in light of the additional information that was requested or um, which should have been provided early, um, we have two issues um, or two documents or two um, items that show um, the cash app, which finally shows that it appears the Senator Fate's cash app and the payment going to uh, Somali TV. Um, what what I'm seeking is um, there still is no invoice that shows the services or documentation to verify what those payments were for specifically. Has any of that information been obtained from the Minnesota Somali TV? So Senator Fateh or your counsel, that was a question I had. Uh, is there any granularity to the uh, production versus the actual airing costs of the $1,000 payment that was made? I'm um, sorry, and you were Miss Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, Senator Fate was not given an invoice for uh, the ads, um, for the production and ads themselves airing. Um, instead, he was, uh, he was simply told what the total would be. He contacted Somali TV inquiring about uh, placing those ads and then was was informed what the cost would be, and he paid that amount, which again is indicated by the cash app uh, receipts and I guess back back receipts showing that the account belongs, showing that the account belongs to Senator Fate. Additionally, we did provide um, the page from his Wells Fargo transaction log that shows uh, the one payment coming. Uh, from the Wells Fargo account. And Senator Fate can also speak to um, the other payment. The other payment came from out of the reserve of money in his cash app um, app itself. And I, I guess I will turn to Senator Fate to explain that um, to the subcommittee as well. Senator Fate. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as Ms. Hendrick indicated, the first payment um, through cash app uh, I, I believe it was the first payment. Let me double check. No, I'm sorry. I apologize. The second payment from Cash App um, was taken. No, I, I apologize. The first payment was taken out of uh, Cash App for June 20th, um, out of for via Wells, uh, from Cash App, out of the Wells Fargo account because there was no money in the reserve. Um, the way the Cash App uh, application works is that uh, anyone that receives money uh, on the app, uh, you have to go in and select the option for cashing out so that when you cash out, it deposits the money from the app into, into, your, into your bank account. Um, if you don't do that, then uh, the money sits in the application and you're still able to use it. Uh, for example, um, Mr. Chair, if today uh, I provide you a service you send me $200, um, and uh, I receive that into my, into my cash app, and I never deposit it, it'll still sit in the application itself. Um, so that if I go on and pay another friend, it, it'll, the application will pull from the app the money rather than my account, my bank account. Um, so the money is still there, it just sits in the app rather than in the bank account. So the second payment reflects that because um, between the time of the two videos, um, I've had other transactions outside of this, uh, and I never cashed out uh, or deposited the, the money from the app into my bank account, um, that it simply pulled uh, from the reserves and paid Somali TV through that. 
So, Senator Fatale, you just actually brought up an interesting point. How many videos did you pay for? It now it seems as you have paid for two different videos, or was it one video playing multiple times? Nope. So, it's not multiple times. I think they just post it uh, on their social media, and it just keeps running. Um, so, we've had services, multiple videos, um, uh, that if they don't produce it, you simply send it to them. And they might make an edit, they might not make an edit, and then they post it for free because they're just using anyone that sends them a video, they utilize their space to just post on, um, on their, on their uh, YouTube and on their Facebook. Those are the two main sources that they use. Um, so if, for example, you have a friend and you record a video and you say, hey, um, I'm doing this and I want you to uh, post this, they'll post it. If I have an interview with uh, uh, a journalist, for example, then I'll pull the video from whatever media website it is. I'll say, hey, can you crop this and post it? And they'll do it. Uh, so we've had several videos from all those types of examples, from ranging from me also recording um, to having uh, media also uh, interviews done as well. So for this $1,000 then, Senator Fateh, how many videos did this, did this uh, pay for? I believe it was just the two videos. Just two videos. I and believe it was so. For posting them, it was not necessarily "quote unquote" airing them, which was a traditional method. You would think with airing them on TV, the number of spots that it would take place, number of times it would air, there were no guarantees, or you're not aware of any guarantees on how many people were going to actually touch and look at it, and you weren't paying based upon the number of views. Correct, because it's not it's not physically placed on television. It's called Somali TV. But they, from what I understand, they only use YouTube and Facebook. Um, so there's not going to be like a Channel 9 uh, advertisement video, if that makes sense. It's just purely through social media and YouTube. Further questions, Senator Coran? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In relation to the, uh, I mean, I, I think the testimony from Senator Fateh um, indicates multiple times that he says they're providing free services and they, and they, 501c3 um, is ineligible to provide free services to any candidate or campaign. What is still not clear, and even in today's testimony, is that um, Senator Fate made a uh, statement about, well, if they produce it. Senator Fate, um, who, who is they if they produce it in your statement that you just made? Um, is Somali TV, have they produced any videos for you? Yeah. Senator Fate. So to answer that question, um, f f two things. Number one, uh, when, we, I, I'm not, when I say f uh, a service, it's not literally them uh, providing the service for us. Um, they can pull uh, media or, or other videos and post it on their website, uh, their Facebook, and their YouTube. So they're not doing the work of recording a video, chopping it, editing it, and posting it. Um, so if, the, if I say, for example, hey, um, this is just for the first part what Senator Cran's mentioning. If I say, like last time I had a WCCO video interview, um, they saw it, they cropped it, and they posted it uh, on, their, on, on Somali TV uh, saying interview from WCCO. Um, that wasn't them producing it. That wasn't them recording it. That was uh, WCCO doing that, and they posted that. Um, for the second part, when I say uh, producing it, they recorded the video. Um, they edit it, uh, and they sometimes even provide translation uh, services. For example, if I'm not able to say something in Somali, they can do, do that also. Um, and this is beneficial for the community because um, the community, especially the elders that don't speak English, they rely on Somali TV uh, to get their news, to know what's happening um, in terms of, for example, COVID response, all of the above. To that point, Senator Champion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarity, uh, Senator, it is my understanding that you were saying that there were, there were two videos that were posted on Somali TV and that you paid for them in large chunks, right? So like from X date to X date, there's just a fee that's paid in order for that video to be posted on, on the, on the uh, Somali TV channel. So, so first of all, I want to know if, if that's correct. And then my second question is, um, you, you've been talking a lot about editing videos and who's producing the videos. Um, 
and 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 and, and so I want to know for clarity, did did your campaign prepare the video and then just ha and submitted it to Somali TV, uh, and if so, who then is responsible for the disclaimer or the lack of disclaimer on the video? Thank Senator, you, Senator Fatan. Uh, no, so, can you repeat the first question again? I apologize. Senator, Ch uh, Ch Senator Champion. So the first question is, uh, um, I believe that you talked about that the two different $500 payments were for your video being posted on Somali TV, and that it wasn't per time it ran. It was just that it's posted there and people could go there and view it. And so I wanted to make sure that I had that correct, that it was that 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 the five hundred dollar the first five hundred dollar payment was for that video to be posted on Somali TV from X date to X date, and then the second payment was from X date to X date. Especially if there's no guaranteed runs and ads, I just want to make sure. First of all, the first question is whether I got that correct. Senator correct. Pertain. Correct. So um, it's for it's to produce a video and to post it. Um, they produce it and they post it, but there is no start and end date. They just put it on uh, Facebook, for example, and it runs indefinitely. Um, I believe they might have over 100,000 or so followers, um, so um, there wasn't any question on my side who would see it, how many people would see it. Um, I know a lot of folks use them as a, as a way that to get their news, for example, so it was a good idea to get, use it for that outreach. Senator Champion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So when you say produce the video, I just want to make sure that we're both using the same language. Producing a video usually means to me writing the script, having a storyboard, you know, f uh, getting any B-roll and producing a video, a finished video. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and so are we on the same page with what you mean by producing a video? That also includes editing. So... Um, uh, so can you just clarify whether I have that definition correct? Senator Fatay. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Except for the, the script part. So I came up with the wording of the videos. Um, they recorded it, um, and uh, they provided the editing. Um, now, as far as the disclaimer issue, they're the ones that recorded it and produced it. But ultimately, the buck stops with me. It was my responsibility to, uh, uh, to ensure that it got placed on there. Um, and that was my mistake, um, but in terms of the service that was provided, it's the production, meaning uh, they record it, they edit it, uh, and they post it, um, but I'm the one that determines um, what I'm saying in the video. For example, I'm the one that writes the script. They don't do a storyboard, they don't do a script, at least in my situation. They could for other videos, but um, not for this campaign. And Senator Champion? And, and Mr. Chair, thank you. And so with that being said, did you have an opportunity to review the video before it is posted? Because usually you have to sign off on the product and, make, and really make sure that it truly represents what you want to be posted or placed in the public. Did you have a chance to review that? Senator um, Pertain? To the best of my knowledge, I believe that it was probably edited three or four times. It was edited multiple times. So um, yes, I would say yes. Senator Champion? And just to be clear that you said it was edited, which makes sense, right? Videos have always been edited. You want to make sure that it, it's right. Um, but you had a chance to, to view the video before uh, it, it was finalized and then posted on Somali uh, TV. Is that right? Senator um, Yes. From what I remember, it was finalized in terms of um, before. We didn't, we didn't put a logo on there yet. We didn't put, like, uh, any music on there yet. Um, I remember that one of the videos, um, the main concern was how good my Somali was because I'm not really fluent in Somali, for example. Um, so those were the types of concerns that we were having in terms of the editing, um, not really so much as the logo or anything else like that. And then Senator I, Champion? I don't know if this was covered, but it was probably covered because I had to step out briefly, so my apologies for that. Um, so did you all talk about... Um, uh, I know you had, had said before that you had an oral contract and, and not a written contract. D can you tell me the terms of your agreement with uh, Somali TV? Senator Fate? Yeah, it was a payment for uh, providing the service, meaning um, recording the video, um, editing the video, 
and then posting it uh, on their social media. Senator Champion. And just to make certain, and there was no ending date. So once the two videos or whatever the number of videos um, are was posted, then there was no end date. It would run uh, uh, indefinitely. In perpetuity. Yeah. Senator Fote. From my understanding, it just stays on their pages. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Fate, just as a uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has a question for you, but just not the same line of questioning. Uh, at what point were you made aware or did you become aware that the disclaimer was not on that advertisement? Um, I was not aware until I guess the, uh, I read about it. So Senator Fate, that was May of this year, or I mean, I'm just trying to get a general ballpark of when you realized that that disclaimer was not on there. Um, I can't tell you an exact date, um, but it was after the video was posted. Senator Kipmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, appreciate your being here today, uh, Senator Fateh. So question I have for you, I I'm a little bit puzzled here, looking at the affidavit uh, from Somali TV where it is stated, uh, duly sworn upon oath, and states that Senator Fateh provided the video file for me to broadcast. It doesn't say anything in here about recording, editing, adding translation. It says here that you provided the video file for broadcasting. That's at odds what's being stated here under oath and what you are stating so when you say they record it, you're referring to Somali TV, is that correct? Senator Fateh? Correct, and from what I understand, that is not part of the two videos that were provided. Um, there was a video file I did send uh, to Siad um, after, well after the campaign uh, to post uh, on Somali TV, uh, which he did. Senator that was Kipmeyer. not related to um, the 2020 campaign. Senator Kipmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So again, in their sworn affidavit, it states here June 20th, 2020, and uh, July 4th, 2020, and that is the election was held in November of 2020. So these ads are, again, according to this sworn affidavit, uh, being published, broadcasting, prior to the election in November. So it doesn't seem to jive with what you're saying, Senator Fate. Senator Fate. Maybe you could just okay. clarify that. Senator Fate. Or Thank you, Ms. Mr. Hendricks. Chair. Um, Senator Kiffmeyer, I'll, I'll turn to Senator Fate to also answer, but I believe I can clarify. Um, as Senator Fate has testified today and then also at the hearing last week, there were the videos, that, the paid advertisements. Um, that we've discussed that were the 500, the two different $500 payments, right, for the aggregate of the $1,000 paid. So those two $500 payments, um, as he has testified, that was paid to Somali TV for the filming, um, as, as he's already just testified, what, what he means by production in, in this instance, as we've gone over with Senator Champion as well, um, for the filming, editing, um, and then posting of the of the campaign ad videos. As he's also testified, there was the video of um, an interview he did on WCCO that was also sent over to Somali TV. And that was, um, as Senator Fateh has explained in his uh, testimony um, today and last week, that was part of the service that Somali TV provides to the Somali community of of um, giving, um, translating, and reposting news that's in the community so that members of the Somali community within our larger Minnesota and Twin Cities community can also understand and benefit from the journalism that's out there um, through other sources. So there were videos that Somali TV has posted um, for others of their own accord. Um, and also for Senator Fateh with including this WCCO video he's testified about, which it seems that that's what paragraph nine is referring to. Um, and then in paragraph 10, I will note that in 10 and 11 of that same affidavit, 
Uh, Syed Saleh goes on to say that he was asked to post a disclaimer on the video. He forgot to post a disclaimer. Again, I think that that also speaks to uh, production work on other videos. Again, I'm I'm going in and seeing what he said, uh, you know. But again, um, I don't believe that the affidavit is in any way at odds with the testimony that Senator Fateh has given unless we just pick and choose specific lines or specific things he said. In some total, I don't believe it is at odds. Senator Kipmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, <laughs> I'm taking the statement right here. Um, you've added some interpretation here rather liberally adding information that doesn't jive with the actual sworn affidavit. Sworn affidavit has provided the video file for me to broadcast. The video file is specific to number six. Uh, by the plain reading of these facts, submit it right here under a sworn affidavit. Statements today from Senator Fateh are adding recording, editing, translating, producing, they recorded, and so on, and has stated to me today and that does not jive with what I'm seeing here on the plain face of this affidavit. Again, uh, tying number six, the precise amount of money, um, and then also provided the video file. There is nothing in here whatsoever uh, to uh, connect to what Senator Fate is saying to today. So I don't know how we get to that, Mr. Chair, uh, without a further... Um, investigation of seeing this, um, but right now, just today, a sworn affidavit, a candidate uh, under oath, this is not fitting. Mr. Chair, Senator... Ms. Hen Ms. Hendrick. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, just in response, I will point also then to paragraph 6 and to paragraph 8, where uh, Syed Saleh, again in his sworn affidavit, refers to campaign ads, plural. So again, using the plain uh, language of the affidavit, when we go through, he's clearly referring in places to multiple ads, not to one singular video um, that, was pro that was provided. So while he may in paragraph nine be referring to one singular potentially WCCO video, he clearly is talking about, um, when he's talking about the payments made, the, 500, the two different $500 payments that were made, uh, he refers to the campaign ads, plural, and then again in paragraph 8, uh, he refers to broadcasting the campaign ads, plural. Um, so again, I, I do not believe that there is any um, issue with the affidavit uh, going against the testimony of Senator Fate today or last week. Senator Kipmar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think you are reading into this. Um, where the facts, I'm just taking the facts of the actual sworn affidavit and Senator Fate's words today. Mr. Chair, thank you for now. Senator Chores Ray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm just curious and I would like to ask you how long are we going to go into the detail of were there two videos, are they paid? Uh, did he turn the videos? Did he make the videos? Did they make the videos? Are the videos worth 500? Were they worth 1,000? Were this done before, after? My understanding is that we are looking into the disclaimer, whether or not the senator acted properly with respect to the rules that exist or reporting what we do. Reporting what we do in this instance is to put a disclaimer saying the campaign paid for it. The senator has said, it was my mistake, it didn't happen. When did you notice? Did you notice a month ago, two months ago? It was done, you didn't do it, and you should have. That they sh how it should have been done in la large print, small print in Somali, in English. H how much detail do we want in this committee? Is isn't this committee about figuring out the rules of whether he reported this or not? And he said, I didn't do the disclaimer. I didn't notice. I made a mistake. You will deal with that with the with the board, 
so, so how, about, how much longer? We, we did three hours last hearing. Are we going to have another three hours of when, how, detail, minute? What, what does it, how does that connect to the actual review of the ethics committee of, of an action taken by our members that relate to a rule that we're supposed to follow? Could you tell me, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm just getting impatient, I'm sorry. Well, Senator, Senator Torres Ray, this is not just about a disclaimer, it's about the entire charge that's been brought forward, um, that it, that it uh, violates the rules of the Senate regarding uh, ethical behavior. Um, I think, Senator Torres Ray, uh, a written contract that would have stipulated what was happening, uh, or at least some documentation from Somali TV, may have made a lot of our questions moot. But at this point, we don't have a lot of backup documentation on what happened, when it happened. Uh, we have a affidavit in front of us. And I think I certainly have some questions regarding the affidavit. I can't say how long we're going to take on, count, on completing count one. I think we're getting relatively close to the end of discussing count one. Uh, I do have a couple, at least one more question, and I don't know if Senator Coran has questions. I think we're moving on relatively soon, but don't, I don't think you should uh, portray this as just a dis question about a disclaimer. I think it's a question about what happened and uh, the complaint, the entire complaint that was brought forward, particularly in regards to account number one. Um, but I, I would sense that members are probably moving on relatively soon. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, M Mr. Chair. I, I guess what I'm asking is for your, for your guidance. I mean, we can go on with the detail, right? And on and on about when and how did the conversation occur? Was it, why was it not in writing? Why did you do a verbal? How many members do we have that do these kind of verbal agreements? Um, do we advise our members that they shouldn't do verbal agreements about how to move forward with printing or doing videos? So, so, so there, is, there is an issue about really how we, we do this business, right, when, when, we, when we contract with somebody. And, and I, I agree with you that the best way is just to have a contract in writing. That's just kind of common sense, right? Uh, but I can guarantee you that there are a lot of us that you know, probably pay for a print and then later on they send the contract or, or something like that. So, so I'm just curious about kind of these, these norms and these actions and this expectation of how we should do business because we think that it owes to be. I, I, I think you're correct and I, I hope you, you do know Senator Fatek, that it is best to have contracts in writing for everything you do, and I hope you, you understand that best now. But, but I think is, is, so the issue of making mistakes, I agree in all of that. Uh, but my question is, to us, you know, as an ethical question of, you know, how that, that translate kind of that norm into violating a rule and how you best do business versus violating a rule. The rule that was violated was not to put the disclaimer. The action was very unwise. <laughs> and then, you know, it's, it shouldn't. So that, I think I'm trying to get to, you know, how much detail about the unwise of, you know, having done it this way or the other way versus violating a rule. To me, there's a difference. Violating the rule of not putting a disclaimer, that is required. It is required that you do in writing and put all, everything with a vendor. I do not know. I think it's wise that you do that. Is it unethical that I didn't have a full contract that says you specify, you know, how the price of this video, specify that the video is done in, on site or not? I don't know. I, I guess I'm asking, Mr. Chair, how long are we going to go into those two directions as an ethics committee, as members of the ethics committee? Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Coran, let me briefly answer uh, Senator Torres Ray. I, I think I said at the last 
meeting uh, that we had, and I'm going to say it again now, this is not necessarily to prove guilt or innocence. Um, this is investigating a charge and going into this level of detail can make the members of this committee comfortable with saying that this doesn't rise to the level of some type of action under Senate rules. And by going into this level of detail, I think it, it is legitimate questions that we have in our minds, or at least some of us have in our minds, as to what actually happened because the information available is relatively thin. Um, you could maybe equate this to a glass being half full or half empty. Uh, I'm not assuming guilt or innocence at this point. I'm just trying to ferret information and determine what the next steps are going to be, because right now we're in a, uh, the phase we're in right now is probable cause to, to go into an investigation. That's what this is. I think there are some key, there are some components here that make me believe we need to investigate if only to clear up unanswered questions that need to be done. Um, I take your point seriously that we need to move on, and I think we are at that point. Um, I think where we have, I have one question. I don't see any additional comments. Senator Coran may have question, one more question or two, um, or at least a closing statement to charge one, um, and then we can move on to item two. But keep in mind, Senator Ray, I'm trying to make sure that we properly investigate and determine if Senator Fate did something that violates rules, and if he didn't, make sure that we are in firm ground to say to the complainants, no, he didn't do any, he didn't rise to the level of violating Senate stat, or the Senate ethics uh, rules that are currently in place. Um, Senator Coran had a comment, and then I'll go to Ms. Hendrick, and then I have a question. Senator Coran. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. In relation to the, to the statement that was just made about an, an element, we're really talking about the sum total of a much more serious issue. The reason we're here in the complaint is um, free services provided by a TV station and a quid pro quo of trying to get them subsequently them trying to get them funding. And the length of this um, informational side of the hearing is only further exacerbated by the lack of verifiable proof for every single issue we brought up and the totality of all of the, the issues, whether it be campaign finance or a simple miss of a disclaimer. Um, those could happen once with an inexperienced campaign or, or a, a constituent running or anybody running for office. The totality of all of these are not simple mistakes. And so they're willful omissions when they all are, are omitted or not complied to from campaign finance to be able to provide verifiable proof of what the payment is made, as well as an invoice. There are so many standards, and Senator Torres Ray, you keep mentioning the standards. These are basic tax law standards in, in requisite to a business and their, their need or legal necessity to function, as well as campaign finance is very clear. And again, the simplest standard that we actually have to can comply with as an elected official or somebody seeking an office. And so Senator Fate's not provided an invoice. And you say, well, it would be nice. It's been over a month. An invoice could be easily obtained. In fact, an IRS um, Re, uh, statutes require it, that those transactions must be obtained and the details and, the, and the, the items of service purchased must be maintained for a period of time. So, so it is not this one particular element. The lack of proof has continued to drag on and the continued testimony continues to divert that these are simple, easily, ver or should be simple, easily verifiable. But when the totality and sum of all of the things that are comprised of this complaint um, without the lack of clarity, that's why we're here today and continuing to, to discuss the detail to try, and to, find out, to try and find out what really happened. And we continue to keep being diverted from factual information about a particular video and statements that are made um, that these are services provided free of charge to the community. You know, some of those things would be true if you're a TV station and you're doing for the greater good. Not true when you're a candidate and you're providing details and content for them to run on your behalf. There are laws that dictate those behaviors. So if, they, if the TV station wants to operate as a public service and offer great news on, on their own behalf, that's true, unless the senator provides the video on their behalf to run on his behalf. Um, that's not, no longer a community good and a public service, but actually falls within the campaign finance rules and laws. And so nothing today in this proof of information is provided um, 
any verifiable proof to be able to discern what was supposedly provided free and those that were directed by and approved even in the disclaimer phase. It's a simple thing. He provided the final proof and added for the productions that he worked with them and it still wasn't done. Again, that's not the only issue. It's just a series of issues that make every video or every service, whether posted on the web, on the Facebook and or on YouTube, makes it indiscernible between whether this is a public service and they're going to operate as a public service in a TV station, whether they call it a YouTube channel or not, or they're providing services to a, a person seeking office and they fall under campaign finance. That's what we're talking about. And it really goes back to um, the free services and that violation in addition to the quid pro quo, and these are just elements of it. So, Mr. Chair, I also have questions. Uh, Senator Coran? Oh, I'm, first off, Senator Coran, I'm going to take that as a final statement because you pretty much blanketed the whole the, the whole gambit. So if you'd like to ask, how many more questions do you have, Senator? Mr. Chair, I, I just I have um, two two very quick questions. Okay, Senator Coran, and then Ms. Hendrick, you're going to be able to get to speak. Don't worry about it. Plus, I'd like to make sure you get a final statement because in respect to Senator Torres Ray, I think she's right. We do need yes, to eventually correct. move on. So Senator Coran has two questions. I have two questions, okay. Senator Coran. And Mr. Chair, so um, that I, I, in summation of complaint for one and two, I would like to withhold until the end, and we will do a final summation of the entire because they're they're interlinked. For the entire um, case, yes, but for, and for closing section one, you pretty much covered the bases. That is correct, Mr. Chair. And so, and the uh, and with the lack of an invoice, so it's been a month since this complaint has been filed. Senator Fate, when did you request an invoice detailing to support your claims that you've made here today from uh, Somali TV? Senator Fate or Ms. Hendricks? Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator. Um, Senator Fate did, uh, and we did request any sort of documentation from Somali TV that they had. Obviously, we can't, they're their own business, and we can't force them to create any document that they do not already have or um, would not already be creating. Uh, to respond briefly as well, uh, Senator Coran, I know in your summation you talked a lot about Somali TV. Again, I think that that is another area where actually this conversation has been diverted a number of times, where um, we're talking about how a business runs itself versus, again, allegations against a, a senator when he was just in, in a campaign and not yet sitting. Um, but again, Senator Fate, we as his counsel, the subcommittee, unfortunately, none of us have control over Somali TV to make them run their business in one way or another or provide documentation if they don't have it. Senator Coran. Mr. Chair, um, yes, the, my statements are in relationship, not to procedures of a, of a business and their choice, but to actual federal law. Um, so it's not that complicated. And so I've, I've made no uh, deviation from the path. So um, I wasn't clear. You did not request a, um, a, an invoice from Somali TV. Ms. Sandra? You did or did not? Mr. Chair, Senator, we have requested information from Somali TV if they had anything along the lines of an invoice or anything else that would, would be useful, obviously. And we have provided um, what we have. Senator Coran. Mr. Chair, um, uh, along those lines, uh, so you, you, you did request it, but, and he was unable to obtain, obtain it because of some, some complexities in, in getting an invoice for what services. Um, so they refused your claim, or they refused your request. Senator Hendrick, or, sorry, Senator, I've, I've upgraded you. Ms. Hendrick. <laughs> or downgrade. <laughs> or downgrade. <laughs> Mr. Chair, Senator, again, we have provided to the subcommittee what we have in our possession. Senator Coran. Mr. Mr. Chair, and that's a no, they did not ask. And so with that, but they did ask for an affidavit. Was that affidavit provided willingly by the, uh, by the same person that you didn't ask for an invoice? Ms. Hendrick. Mr. Chair, Senator, I, I believe you are misstating um, my statements. Again, I have indicated we provided what... Somali TV has provided to us. Um, and yes, we uh, did ask uh, Syed Salah if he would be willing to provide an affidavit. Again, we wanted to have as complete a record for the subcommittee as we could. 
Senator Mr. Cole. Chair, quick follow-up uh, from, um, so with that, one, that issue, I'm fine. Moving on to the next question. Um, on the payments from the Cash App account, it was stated that it was made from a reserve. Senator Fate, how did you know there were $500 in reserve to be able to uh, make that payment out of reserve? Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the way the app works is that if there's nothing in the reserve, it'll pull it from your bank account. And if there is, uh, it'll pull it from that reserve. So pointing at both receipts, um, uh, number page number four, if everyone has the same page uh, numbers uh, in the evidence, it shows destination marked as cash rather than uh, page number nine that shows Wells Fargo as the source. So it pulled from my account on one transaction because there was no reserve in the, in the app versus having a reserve in the other transaction. <coughs> Sen uh, Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was almost a senator again for a moment. <laughs> no, uh, I, I count as, myself. It was coming out of your mouth. Um, I, just reflex. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, based on your facial expression for that, I just thought I would make a go at explaining the Cash App as well. Um, as Senator Fate is explaining, or as explained earlier this morning as well, Cash App works similarly to um, if anyone has used PayPal or some of those other online payment systems where um, you have the account, the Cash App account linked to your bank account. So a lot of times you go to pay through Cash App, you wouldn't have any money sitting in Cash App, but you would go, um, you would pay through Cash App and it would pull from the Wells Fargo account as Senator Fate has pointed to um, both on page one uh, showing the Wells Fargo account draw and then also on page, I believe it was nine, showing the source was the Wells Fargo bank um, which is reflected on page one. However, you can have money sitting in Cash App so Senator Fate wouldn't need to know that there was a balance there, but if he, for example, this was his personal Cash App account that we've already discussed was accidentally used, if he had bought pizza for family and they paid him back through Cash App or whatever else and he had a balance sitting in Cash App, in that instance, the money would come just directly from Cash App versus having to pull from Wells Fargo. Kind of like having a store credit. Um, so if you had, now everybody puts things on, on gift cards, but previously if you had maybe a store credit with a store and you went in to make a purchase that was less than your store credit, you wouldn't have to then pull any additional payment. It would just come out of your store credit. Uh, Senator, to that point, Senator Champion? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, if... Just for clarity. Okay. Just for clarity. Senator Champion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. When you have Cash App, uh, it is money that, let's say for an example, if you, Mr. Chair, was going to send me some money, right, which would be a good deal, right? <laughs> and by you sending me money, that would be in my Cash App account because I would have it there because I did not ask for it to be deposited into my account. That is the card that I have. And when you pull up your page, it tells you how much you have in Cash App. And in the event that I want to pay something out from the money that you sent me, then it would just deduct from my Cash App, but it would be money that, was, that still you, you paid to me. If I don't have enough money in my cash app, which, which is still my money, my, my backup card that is connected to my cash app would still be for withdrawals or deposits is there. So I just want us to be clear that when you look at your cash app page, you will know if you have money in your cash app or not. If you don't, then that's how the that whole thing happens with you. Senator Champion, I don't necessarily have a problem with the cash app. I, I know campaign finance is in the room. The issue I would have is if you just plunked money into, a ca into your cash app account and just let it sit there for whatever your purposes are, I question, okay, what's that look like on your campaign finance documentation? Because then apparently you'll have something that transacts to cash app until you have a bill 
that would flow back into the system. But I'm not going to get into that scenario. Um, I think we've gone far enough on that particular point. Senator, uh, to that point, Senator uh, yeah, Kipmeyer? It is, yeah. So, Senator Fate, do you use this cash app that's being referenced here exclusively for your campaign? Senator Fate? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kipmeyer, I can answer that question. Um, Senator yes, Fate has previously uh, also testified that he had two different cash app accounts. So he had one that's his personal cash app that pre-existed any campaign um, or anything like that. But then when he went into running for office, he created a separate cash app account for his campaign to be able to use. Um, and the same way that if you had a if you bank with Wells Fargo and you had a Wells Fargo app on your phone and your personal banking was with Wells Fargo as was your campaign banking, you would have to log out of one account to then log into the other. The same application on your phone, but you log out of one account, log into another. Or if you had um, Mr. a, a web-based... My, que my question is uh, Senator, answered, Senator I believe. So, Senator Fate, you have both a personal cash app and a campaign cash app. And the question I have is, in the data we're seeing here today, is this a cash app from your campaign account? Very simple, very yes or no. Is this uh, payments reflected from your campaign cash app? Ms. Hendrick? Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. Again, a Senator Fate has previously testified this was his personal cash app. It was used in error which is why he also then followed up um, with the Campaign Finance Board to correct that error. Um, and those updates were also provided um, in the packet as well. But it was his personal cash app account, again, that was used in error. Senator Kipmer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So whenever we that happens, you personally do that. And to tell the truth, when you log into an account, it's usually quite clear what you're in. But nevertheless, if a mistake like that was made, then that personal account usually is reimbursed from the campaign. Was there a reimbursement of that personal payment from the campaign? Yes or no? Ms. Hendrick? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, um, no, it was not a reimbursement that was made as is indicated in the updates, uh, the updated forms. Um, that so were provided, it, uh, Senator Fate instead uh, went back into the bookkeeping and that was um, instead updated as being a campaign contribution on his part. He had only um, made $1,000 of campaign contribution outside of this, so even with the additional aggregate $1,000 contribution, it still kept him below the $5,000 limit, um, but again, uh, it, it, he was not reimbursed by it. He was instructed by campaign finance that uh, a best practice to remedy the mistake that was made was to have it be more of, again, a, a campaign contribution, a personal campaign contribution. Senator Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Coran, you had anything additional? Then I have a couple questions. And we're going no, to move Mr. To Chair, my only, my only question was on Senator Babadio, Babadio champion. Uh, provided that was um, the balance, the carryover cash balance on hand within the account, the point is it shows a balance and there's verifiable proof of those transactions in and out of the cash app account and that proof was also not provided to substantiate where that payment came from. Again, the lack of clarity on all of these transactions that have verifiable proof, that's the beauty about electronic transactions is they record all in and outbound transactions and without providing that proof again, they had a month to be able to provide the supporting documentation to support their claims, and it has not done that. Uh, two brief questions that may be relatively simple to get through. Um, so Senator Fate or Ms. Hendrick, um, earlier you had provided documentation about a number of other campaigns that had used Somali TV for uh, political purposes. Are you aware of uh, are you aware of any of the camp these campaigns providing financial payment for those services? And secondly, are you aware of any other 
uh, any other elected official that was in that group that had put forth any bills to provide funding to Somali TV. Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, no, we do not have any information from other campaigns. Um, again, the allegation before the allegation before the subcommittee currently is whether there was a failure to disclose a conflict of interest, and the basis for that was free campaign ads and or a free endorsement. Um, again, we provided those ads. Um, not to, not again, to draw any question into anyone else or um, to bring in um, any other information. Again, I, I believe that would go very far outside of the scope of this inquiry as to what others paid or how that accounting was done or how Somali TV did that. The same way that if any one of us went in to Target to buy a roll of paper towels and Target said it cost $5, you wouldn't then also say, well, how much does this cost everybody else? When anyone else comes through the line, what do you charge them? Um, as Senator Fateh has uh, testified already, um, he reached out to Somali TV indicating he would like an ad. Um, he was quoted a price and he paid it. There was, um, and that was it. And so um, again, the, the basis of, of the complaint was a failure to disclose a conflict of interest. And that was based on, again, this allegation that there was some sort of free endorsement or a free ad. Last week and today, we've provided um, evidence that this was not an endorsement. We, again, while the language was missed and Senator Fate has taken ownership for that, um, Again, those ads had the same form and looked the same, looked like an ad the same as everybody else's ad. So while that was missed, uh, again, it was in the format of an ad. Um, and again, it, it, we've shown that, that again, he paid for those. So the Cash App, as Senator Curran has noted, uh, the beauty of electronic transactions is there is a log, which has been shown. And again, in the further um, evidence that we've provided for today, it shows specifically the destination, um, where money came from, where it was going to. So we've provided that showing that this was not a free service. This was paid. It was a paid ad, not an endorsement. And so again, going to that complaint that there's a failure to disclose a conflict of interest, the basis for any sort of conflict of interest, any sort of quid pro quo, we've shown there is not a basis for that because of the fact that this was a paid ad. This was not an endorsement. Um, and again, the, the further the further investigation that's been brought up would not change anything um, about the evidence that we have us have before us today showing again that this was paid that it was an ad um, again not a free endorsement not a free service the further investigation that's being discussed is uh, invoicing best practices for Somali TV and some of these other things but again it, no matter what came up we today have already the, the information before us to determine that there was no free endorsement, there was no free advertising, it was paid, and so there wasn't a basis for a quid pro quo. Senator Newman, was something to that point? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Ms. Hendricks has, has argued repeatedly that this involves uh, a free endorsement by uh, Somali TV, and that's not correct. Specifically, count one uh, is whether or not the subcommittee should investigate Senator Fateh's authorship of a bill to appropriate $500,000 to Somali TV after receiving free campaign advertising. That's the allegation. No allegation of endorsement. Um, we have concentrated very heavily on two campaign ads, one for June 20th, one for July 3rd. In the information that was provided uh, to the committee, I, I looked at various campaign ads, and they very clearly indicate uh, solicitation of votes, you know, support me, vote for me. And 
I see an ad for February 3rd, 2018, June 14th, 2018, February 2nd, no, I'm sorry, January 25th, 2018, February 20th, 2018, May 9th, 2020th, August 11th, 2020th, and then, of course, the two ads that we've been talking about. My question, Mr. Chairman, to, to Senator Fateh, did you or your campaign pay Somali TV for any campaign ads or production of any campaign ads other than June 20th, 2020 and July 3rd, 2020? Senator Fateh, do you understand the question? And would you like to answer that? Or is that Ms. Hendrick? I, Ms. Hendrick? I guess I would appreciate the question being, I, I would, Mr. Chair, I would appreciate the question being rephrased. I'm, I'm unclear on what is being asked. Ms. Hendrick, uh, Senator Newman is asking a question regarding additional videos that have been, that have been put up onto Somali TV. Uh, Senator uh, Newman, will you rephrase the dates again, please? There are additional videos that Senator Fateh has, on, uh, has posted on Somali TV. Senator Newman. Yeah, uh, and these are all in, this is all videos that were provided to us uh, I think by Senator Fateh, but I know that uh, um, uh, Ms. Havisto has, has disseminated this information to all of the committee members. And I went and I looked at these videos. And the dates that I'm coming up when I looked at these videos, and they appear to me to be different videos. February 3rd, 2018. January 25th, 2018, February 20th, 2018, May 9th, 2020, August 11th, 2020, um, and then, of course, the two ads that we've been talking about extensively, June 20th, 2020, July 3rd, 2020. My question is, is really pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Senator Fateh, did you pay Somali TV for the production or posting of any TV campaign ads other than June 20th, 2020 and July 3rd, 2020? Senator Fateh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, we provided the information for the two videos and the two agreements that we had. As for 2018, I was a House candidate, so it's not relevant to what's happening right now. But at the same time, as I've stated before, there were multiple videos uh, that was recorded by our team, whether it's my friend or a roommate or someone else that uh, Somali TV could post. Yes, there are times that um, folks can provide ser uh, a service, not a service, but a video. And in turn, Somali TV would post that because they're not the ones that did the recording. Um, but as to which videos they recorded or I recorded, uh, I'm not, I, I don't have them in front of me, but there were videos, a lot of videos that, um, and interviews also that I provided to them for them to post. But going back to the two videos, yes, they, they were responsible for the production, um, editing, and okay. posting. Uh, so then, Senator Fateh, one additional question. So, uh, posting on YouTube and Facebook um, has different eccentricities, I think you would say, versus having it on a TV channel. Uh, I think we've sort of established that. Um, most times when that happens, uh, when you're doing an at-will or at-use application such as YouTube, uh, you pay for having a higher or a guaranteed placement uh, on the, in other words, making the clip more prominent when you do a name search on the application itself. Is part of the $1,000 that you spent or included in this also pay for higher placement of those ad, quote unquote advertisements or campaign support uh, 
videos uh, were that to boost them. And Facebook is called boosting, and I've paid for it myself, and it's on my campaign finance report. Uh, same thing goes with YouTube. Do Did any of this financing uh, of this video pay to boost them or push them up uh, as far as utilization when, you, when they do a name search? Senator Fate. Uh No, we didn't discuss um, any boosting or promotion in that in that sense. It was just simply posting. Okay. Uh, Senator F Kiffmeyer. Thank you. To that point in regards to the list that Senator Newman provided, this is relevant because it shows a pattern of conduct, of disregarding ethical conduct in regards to complying with the rules of which camp uh, the Senate rules are ethical conduct of the highest standard, which includes state laws and Senate rules, but state laws as well. So a lack of compliance and a pattern of showing that, that um, this was something that maybe was done in the past and continued to do as a senator, that makes those actions in the House area, um, they are relevant uh, to our um, hearing today. Thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions. Ms. Hendrick, would you like to have a closing statement, respond to that, and have a closing statement on count one? Then we're going to move to count two. Thank Senator, you. Ms. Hendrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Kiffmeyer, just to briefly, just to briefly respond, um, what Senator Fate, I believe, was, was mentioning in terms of things that weren't relevant were the 2018 ads that were listed out by the senator um, for that were for the House race, um, because obviously any of the ads that his campaign ran um, when he was running for the House would not be reflected in any campaign finance here uh, regarding his Senate run um, or anything of that nature. And so, uh, again, the 2018 House race ads um, were not included in the complaint or really are not part of his uh, run for um, Senate or um, his, his time in the Senate. So again, when he's saying that it, it wasn't part of this, it wasn't really on point for this hearing, he was referring to the, to the ads that again were all listed out. There were a number listed for 2018 um, that again were, were for that House race. Um, very briefly in closing, I will just note again, um, in the complaint, in complaint one, the allegations again state at the beginning, the title of complaint one, failing to disclose a conflict of interest uh, despite receiving primary election campaign promotion. Um, and then using that as a basis for saying that the, uh, the authored appropriation bill was a quid pro quo. I will note throughout the paragraphs of complaint one, um, in paragraph five, it talks about an ad. In paragraph 17, um, there is a quote where that they included, that complainants included, that uh, refer to it as an endorsement. So they did include language relating to an endorsement in the complaint in paragraph 17. Um, whether it's their words or quoted words, they chose to adopt them in their language they included in their complaint. I will again note that in front of the subcommittee today with the evidence that's been provided, with the testimony that's been provided, Senator Fate has shown that one, there was no free advertising uh, created or given to him. He's shown the, um, he has shown that he has the receipts that he paid for this. Senator, would you, would you mind keeping your voice down while I'm speaking? I, I did the same for you, thank you. Um, we've shown multiple times throughout uh, the many different receipts that we've provided to the subcommittee that the advertisements were paid. We've also shown in the form of the advertisements that were provided both of Senator Fate's cam campaign as well as the campaigns of others that uh, this was not an endorsement. While the language, again, that Senator Fate has, has come forward, taken ownership of the fact that he needed to make sure that language was there, the form, the format of the ads was the same as ads for anyone else. Frankly, I don't think anyone was confused it was an ad, but I understand the need to have a, have a disclaimer on something that's an advertisement. Um, 
in, in these cases, again, he's taking ownership for that. But again, these were paid ads, not endorsements. Because there was no free endorsement, no free ad, there would be no basis for a quid pro quo. So there was no conflict of interest for him to disclose, and therefore there is no probable cause to move forward on complaint number one. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Curran, we're gonna move on to count number two. I think it's fair that she had her f final closing statement. You will have an opportunity to close the entire case. I would suggest you include that in whatever you're going to say in your final comment. Mr. Chair, I was not gonna make a statement, of, okay. a closing statement, but Senator Curran. the anticipation when we were speaking of the topics um, of the Cash App and the clarification on that particular issue, um, the we, we still did not cover the campaign finance um, the confusing um, in-kind donation guidance from the campaign finance, and I thought we were we were going to be able to hear that evidence or uh, hear that hear the statement and how one gives an in-kind contribution to um, their own campaign relation and related to the the supporting information that they submitted since last hearing. Uh, Senator Coran, we do have campaign finance in the room. I actually am comfortable with the direction that has been taken with campaign finance. That's why I didn't bring it up, is that if there's a member of the committee that wants to have campaign finance come up, that's fine. Um, okay. Senator Kipmeyer. Um, the, one of the purposes here is not to just take um, statements when we have somebody here in the room can speak to it specifically. So I'd like to put that on the record. Okay. Um, then we will have campaign finance step forward, uh, Megan Engelhart, and she will take the testifier's position before you sit down. Uh, would you raise your right hand? We do need to put you under oath. Do you swear that the evidence you shall give to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth to so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Megan Engelhart, and I'm the Assistant Executive Director for the Campaign Finance and Public Disclosure Board. So just to cut to the chase, would you like to explain the documentation that was provided to us? Um, I can certainly talk about generally in-kind contributions are fairly common. Um, and I can specifically talk about the conversation that I had with Mr. Fat, uh, was sorry, with Senator Fatia, because I was actually the person that assisted him in doing that, as luck had it. So, um, generally, in kind contributions are when fairly common for most candidates. I think, um, especially this time of year, the easiest example is when a candidate is filing for office. They may have not formed a candidate committee and they go to the filing, the Secretary of State's or their county, and they pay that $100 filing fee out of their own personal funds. And then when they pay that, then on the report, they're going to report if they, if that's what they did, they paid out of their personal funds and they don't want to be reimbursed by the committee, it's an in-kind contribution to the committee and also a non-campaign disbursement. So they'll report an in-kind contribution to the candidate committee from themselves and then an in-kind expenditure because whenever you have an in-kind contribution, you have an in-kind expenditure. Fairly common for candidates to do this. Maybe they forget the candidate handbook, uh, the candidate checkbook or credit card when they are on the way to Target picking up water bottles for door knockers, et cetera. Um, and candidates then record those in-kind contributions coming in and going out on their report. So if you want me to specifically address this, I can. Um, Senator Fatia came in and asked to amend his report. Unfortunately, he did not have access to the software. Um, so we sort of supplemented in paper reports and didn't ask him to redo the entire paper report. So that's why some are copies of his um, electronic filing where he used the CFR software and others are pages. I did not speak to the Senator specifically about what the purpose of the in-kind contribution. We spoke generally about if you pay for something personally on for your committee and it benefits the committee, it then needs to be reported as an in-kind contribution. I think I probably did use the water bottles at Target because that is one of my favorite go-tos um, because a lot of candidates do end up doing that. And the Senator then amended his report and filed it and I have to 
I forget the actual date, but he did file that in our office and the amendment should be on our website. Uh, so, um, Ms. Engelhardt, I think you sort of solved the riddle I had, which was why it wasn't just called a cash contribution, because technically at the time it was a cash contribution, but it was an in-kind, you called it an in-kind because the campaign did not, is not going to and will not pay back the $1,000 that the candidate paid, so that's why you called it an in-kind contribution, Ms. Engelhardt. Yes, that is correct, Mr. Chair. The candidate can decide how they want to do it. If they want to be reimbursed, they could be reimbursed, and then the actual um, the report would show that that the committee paid for that, and then their record should have a reflection that it was a reimbursement. So instead, it would have showed a campaign expenditure to um, Somali TV, and then their own personal records would have shown that there was a reimbursement. That's one way to record it. They could make Senator, um, the senator the payee, but they have to show that the expenditure went to Somali TV. So there's kind of several options for candidates to pick from. If they want to be reimbursed, they can do that. Several candidates, as long as they're under the $5,000, if they sign the public subsidy agreement limit that they could give to their own Senate or House committee, they choose to do an in-kind contribution and then in-kind expenditure. Question. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Engelhart. is Senator Fate in compliance with the rules that you, that the board, um, as in place with respect to reporting and doing what he has to do now. Ms. Engelhart. Um, to the best of my knowledge, Mr. Chair, Senator Torres Ray, this would comply with what we asked, um, and that would be a sufficient report. We typically do not ask for receipts um, when candidates make amendments. If we had reason, we would do, we could potentially do an audit or a self-report, but filing an amendment because a candidate or the treasurer forgot something is fairly common. So um, this is something that candidates frequently call and ask for help and we assist them in filing the amendment and proceed from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want the members to hear that. Um, so he is in compliance. He has done the work that he has to do. Thank you very much. Senator Kithmar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Ms. Engelhardt, I'm confused here because having filed a number of campaign finance reports in my lifetime and helped others as well, specifically on this form, it says list item and fair market value. So what we're talking about here is Senator Fateh used personal cash to pay for this TV ad, whatever there's no invoice, so we're just calling it that. But he paid cash for it. But in an in-kind, it says, list the item and fair market value. So what we're really saying here is Senator Fate donated a TV ad. And yeah. that is the item, and its fair market value is $500. So the item is the ad. Ms. Engelhardt? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, yes, the item is the ad. He used his personal cash to purchase the ad, and then what he reports on the report is the ad being given to the committee. I, I agree he could have done it differently should he have chosen to make the cash contribution and be reimbursed, but that was not how he chose to. He chose to intend, instead make it an in-kind contribution and an in-kind expenditure. So essentially, he bought the ad for $500 and then gave the ad to his committee. Um, like when you go to pay the filing fee, you pay that and then you give, I sh just used air quotes, which won't show on there, but you give the filing fee to the committee because it is something that has value to the committee. So anytime a candidate personally pays for something, they can choose to be reimbursed, which would need to be recorded, but they could also choose to in-kind that, which does count towards their total contributions if they've signed the public subsidy agreement. So, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. The reason why this is really important is because that's never been my understanding before. It's an item. Uh, and when this is related to cash, so I just really wanted to understand this. So he purchased an ad and then donated that 
to the committee. Be the reason why this is important, because other candidates may want to do the same thing. And if this is an allowable way to do something, that's news to me. So, especially in relationship to an ad. So there are a variety of ways that this could have an implication. So, Mr. Chair, I wanted to clarify this and make sure that it was on the record in case any future candidate of any other sort uh, may be in the same situation would know that this is a legitimate way to do it. But they're not donating the cash. They're donating the TV ad already purchased with personal funds. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep. And I think to add to that, just because I happen to know campaign finance rules, they, if they have signed the public subsidy agreement, their in-kind contribution cannot exceed $5,000 because that is the cap that they're under when they sign that agreement. If they don't sign the agreement, then it is unlimited uh, value that they can put, put forth to their campaigns. Ms. If Anglard. I may, Mr. Chair, that is correct. I would say the total would be for House and Senate $5,000, and it would be a combination of a cash contribution, in-kind contributions, and potential loans all count towards that contribution total of $5,000. So thank and, you. And I, I agree with the, the, the accounting of it. It's showing up now. I, I don't think it's an issue. It, it's two years after the fact, but it is. Uh, it certainly does reflect now um, that. Senator Kiffmeyer. One final question. State law currently requires all candidates to use the campaign finance software. There is an exception for that, and it sounds like from what I heard you say here that Senator Fate is filing by actual hard copies, written paper documents. What is the basis for exempting him from using the digital finance uh, reporting software, which, by the way, is very, very helpful and helps you keep track of all these things and lets you know if you've gone over any amounts. It's very helpful. But what was the reason for the exception since he ran for the House and now for the Senate? What was the reason for the exception? Because they're pretty narrow. Ms. Engelhardt? Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, you are correct. Uh, candidates are required to use the electronic filing software. We call it the CFR. Um, as most of you may be aware, it is, I agree, thank you for the plug for the CFR. It is very good. Um, it is, the problem sometimes is when um, you are an amending a report two times ago, it is entirely possible that that record may not still be on your computer for various reasons. If the CFR... Um, as, as you all are probably aware, the CFR right now, as it currently exists, is a, a software base, a Microsoft software based system that lives on one computer. And then as maybe you move treasures, maybe you have a copy of it, but you don't maybe have an updated put it in. So you might have 2021 and 2022 on your current PC, but you might not have 2020. It's not ideal. You should have all years. I would readily agree with that. It is fairly common for candidates to say, you know, I need to amend something. My treasurer that had 2020 was not um, available. And the executive director and I did discuss this and felt this was the fastest, easiest way to amend because we always want them to amend within 10 days. Um, it is my understanding that um, the senator does continue to use the CFR for 2022, so he still is electronically filing. He's just amending a past year, and we do, um, in the interest of public disclosure, try and get the report on the website as fast as possible for the amendment. So oftentimes we will offer candidates that originally filed with the CFR, we offer them a paper report if that is easier slash quicker for them to make the amendments. Um, and that is somewhat common, especially as we are moving to a new software, a web-based system, hopefully in 2023. Sometimes the software just can't be updated. Now the treasurer might have a Mac computer and they can't use the software on a Mac or an Apple product. So we've tried to be somewhat flexible with that because of that software issue. So Thank you, oh, Mr. Chair, I have filed as three different campaign committees and I still have them. And uh, granted, I've been the same user for all that period of time, but I think it's important for people to know there's tremendous value at having those records um, available to yourself um, for what you do, but it is um, there. So 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that helps clarify, and I think it's especially important because folks might be watching. It's important for them to know um, this, but so thank you very much. And just to add on, the, another reason for this to be an in-kind is it will not cause a chain reaction because if they had to go back to 2020 to record a $1,000 repay to the candidate, it would cause a $1,000 cash balance change in 2020, 2021, and the start of 2022, which would cause all these adjustments to take place. I, I totally understand why and do not, I am totally comfortable with what's happened, though two, two years late. Uh, I'm totally comfortable with how the reporting has gone on this, and I don't have a problem with the reporting pro aspect of this. Senator Coran, did you have a, que you have a question? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think it was in the scenarios provided in which cash in kind are common, I think they, they are, in co are, are common, um, based on the scenarios that were provided, were um, you know, a candidate newly formed and or a, a candidate um, who would seek guidance because they had to buy the pop or whatever on, on the fly, but in this particular case, I think the candidate is listed as the treasurer. So the candidate has access to all the official payment methods to be able to record those transactions and have receipts to do so. So, so Senator Coran, my suspicion is Senator Fateh has a new treasurer. Is that, is that true? That was why you can't use the campaign finance reporting? We're in the process of getting in. That's, I've had a very easy answer to that one. Any additional questions? We're going to go to a recess, if not... If, uh, if not, before we move to charge two, so we can all have a quick break. Um, seeing no objection, uh, we will take a 10 minute break. We will return at 10 minutes to 11. Uh, this committee stands in recess.
we will move on now to complaint number two. Uh, we will have a summary statement at the end of, of both of the complaints that will come encompass both of them. Uh, but who would like to do for the complainants, who would like to do the statement, opening statement? Senator Coran, opening statement to complaint number two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Complaint number two, um, what I'd like to do is just kind of go through for the record um, like we did in complaint one. So um, complaint two starts out with um, Senator Fate violated Senate Rule 56.3 by failing to expressly address his involvement in the unauthorized delivery of 2020 primary election absentee ballots uh, and retaining his staffer who reportedly directed the fraudulent election activity. Um, on point one of the information that was, was provided in the complaint, uh, Muzi Mohammed, Mohammed Mohammed um, is Senator Fateh's brother-in-law and previous campaign volunteer. His address matches the previous residence of Senator Fateh's wife, um, Kaltam, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, uh, Kaltam Mohammed and Zainab Mohammed. Um, the DFL endorsed candidate running in the district currently represented by Senator Patricia, Patricia Torres Ray. Um, and uh, this information um, was included in uh, one of the Minnesota reformer articles. On point two, on May 10th, uh, Muhammad was convicted, uh, Muzi Muhammad was convicted in federal court aligned to a grand jury regarding his involvement in delivering absentee ballots during the 2020 primary election without voters' consent. Um, and I think in, in the grand jury testimony or the, the case, it looks like it's um, protecting those that who actually provided him the ballots. Uh, point three, the FBI investigation into election fraud committed during the 2020 primary election included up to 80 witnesses. In the, case closing, in the case's closing arguments, U.S. Assistant Attorney Kimberly Svensson stated, simply put, uh, Mr. Muhammad didn't want to tell the grand jury where he got those ballots, so he lied. Again, followed up in a document, documented by the a story in the Minnesota Reformer. Point four, according to Sahan Journal, article dated May 10th, 2020, Senator, uh, State Senator Omar Fateh says he's troubled by the convictions of his brother-in-law and campaign manager or campaign volunteer, Musi Muhammad. Musi lied to the federal grand jury about, the, about handling absentee ballots in Omar's 2020 primary campaign. Muhaz, Muha, Muhammad uh, stated that a campaign official named Dawson gave him the list of three voters in, the, in question whom he later acted as an agent for. Point five, Senator Fateh's campaign manager and Senate legislative assistant is Dawson Kimmian. Point six, Dawson Kimmian was placed on administrative leave from the Senate on May 11th, 2022. However, he was, at the time, he was still listed as, uh, as Senator Fateh's um, uh, campaign manager, which I believe has recently been updated. Point seven, following the announcement of Muhammad's conviction, Senator Tom Fateh released a, released a statement. Our campaign's mission has always been to motivate and organize people in our district to participate in elections. In doing so, we are committed to upholding our state's election laws and processes. I'm troubled by the conviction. I'm more than committed than ever to organizing um, and governing to strengthen a fair and free democracy. Point eight, as an elected officials, all members of the Minnesota Senate must work to ensure the integrity of the state's electoral system. Point nine, Senator Fate's failure to unequivocally refute his personal involvement and or the involvement of his staff, Senate staff following the federal conviction of Muzi Muhammad Muhammad violates acceptance of norms of Senate behavior, betray, betrays the public trust, and brings the Senate into dishonor and disrepute. So with that, Mr. Um, Mr. Chair, that's the complaint, and I think we have just a few questions. Uh, so for opening statement, we'll go to Ms. K Ms. Hendricks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to start by pointing out what is not included in the allegations um, of complaint number two. What's not included is there's no allegation of any wrongdoing on Senator Fate's part. Uh, with regard to um, any sort of election fraud. Uh, there's also no allegation that he directed any wrongdoing, either in the complaint or in any of the um, attached documents to the complaint that was submitted, um, including the entire transcript from Musa Muhammad's trial. And there's also no allegation that he even failed to speak out against any wrongdoing that was alleged. Um, where the complaint itself, when read plainly, includes the fact that Senator Fata did make a statement against um, any sort of election fraud, indicating, again in his statement, that 
he is committed to upholding the state's election laws and processes. Um, and, and after that was more committed than ever to organizing and governing to strengthen a fair and free democracy. In complaint number two, there was nothing to express or admit because Senator Fata had no personal involvement in any unauthorized delivery of primary election ballots, which I will note is not what Musa Mohammed was convicted of. He was convicted of perjury, um, but not actually a conviction relating to any specific election fraud activity. Also, Senator Fata did not direct or uh, direct anyone or condone the unauthorized delivery of election ballots. Again, that's not even an allegation, um, but again goes to something that he would not expressly address um, when, it, when the complaint is that he failed to expressly address his involvement. Again, there would be nothing for him to address because he had no involvement. He was as shocked as everyone on this panel and the complainants themselves when he learned of the charges against his brother-in-law and uh, when he learned of the conviction for perjury at trial. The allegations of complaint two do not illustrate inaction on Senator Fatah's part. Uh, leading up to the Musa Muhammad trial, the Senator didn't think it was appropriate to make any public comment because he didn't want to interfere with the judicial process. Immediately after Musa Muhammad's conviction, the Senator issued a statement clarifying his commitment to upholding election laws and expressed how troubling the conviction was to him. These are all things that he today reaffirms to the subcommittee. Um, while he was still reeling from that conviction and the allegations that were brought up, Senator Fatah heard that his staffer, Dawson Kimyon, had potentially been implicated in the testimony at Mr. Muhammad's trial. In reading of the transcript that was provided of that trial, um, the name Dawson came up in some of the testimony. Um, but again, that transcript was not available the date of the conviction and was not available the date following the conviction. Um, transcripts take time to, <laughs> to receive. So again, while he was trying to learn the nature of those allegations, because anything that he heard was simply through the news, um, with no court transcript yet to consult and no criminal charges pending against Mr. Kimyon, the senator was trying to determine the appropriate steps to take. Musa Muhammad was convicted, as is indicated in the complaint, on May 10th in the afternoon. By the morning of May 11th, Dawson Kimian had been placed on a leave of absence, less than 24 hours after the conviction being entered. Um, then Mr. Kimyon later resigned on May 24th to avoid any sort of appearance of impropriety, still having not been charged even to date with any crime. Again, um, Senator Fata took action quickly, less than 24 hours after uh, the conviction, less than 24 hours after this implication of Mr. Kimyon uh, in the testimony came to his attention. Mr. Kimian was placed um, already on administrative leave. Uh, when it comes in the complaint to the allegation, or I guess just the fact in, in paragraph six, um, that Dawson Kimian was still noted on the website as the legislative assistant when this was filed. Um, again, Senator Fata is not with HR or IT for the Senate and is unable to update those things himself. Again, um, to reaffirm today, Senator Fata had no direct uh, or indirect encouragement or direction to do anything improper with voting, absentee balloting, or any part of the electoral process. I would also note that it is neither the norm nor the policy of the Senate to compel or dictate that senators denounce other individuals. Any attempt by the Senate to do so significantly threatens the speech rights and integrity of this body. None of the circumstances mentioned in the complainant's uh, complaint even suggests that Senator Fata uh, had any individual wrongdoing. Rather, it's a blatant attempt to use the Ethics Committee to compel political speech and should be summarily dismissed on its face. Thank you. Questions, Senator Coran. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And in this uh, complaint, when you look at the totality of the, um, I think the, the clarity that Dawson Kimmon um, has been Senator Fate's not only his LA, but his longtime campaign manager. And when we talk about the ethics within the body and the preservation of this, of this body, and when this investigation is a year old, and looking at one of the recent stories from the, uh, um, the Minnesota reformer, um, it's stated in there that Senator Omar Fate uh, misled or claimed to not know who Musi Muhammad was when asked directly about this particular um, scenario or investigation, which was a year old by that time. Um, Senator Fate, was this story correct that when asked about it that you misled the, your colleagues, which would be the first um, level of reporting within this institution of an issue that arises within our body. So. Uh, Senator Coran, so just, uh, I'll let your question stand, but uh, you're talking about uh, an article perhaps that was not included in the complaint. Oh. So uh, I'm not sure that it necessarily can be talked about. Um, I don't know if Senator Fate wants to discuss this, Senator Fate. Sorry, yeah, you were you brought up my point that it wasn't part of the evidence. So thank you, Senator Coran. Additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, with the close relationship and the, I think some of the testimony that's leaked out in the uh, from the grand jury, um, this is a year-long investigation in, involving multiple people who've worked very closely or within um, Senator Fate's campaign office. Is Senator Fate, uh, is, this is an a ongoing, long investigation. Um, have you been interviewed by the FBI um, or appeared in front of the grand jury or have been subpoenaed for, on this particular matter? Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Curran, no, uh, Senator Fate has not um, been subpoenaed. Senator Curran? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And... Um, <laughs> Let's see here. I got to make sure. Um, Mr. Chair, um, and I guess the Senate staff uh, or uh, council, there's another article in Minnesota Reformer um, about another uh, gentleman uh, related to. Uh, um, Mr. Kimian, in as far as this testimony of Mustafa Hassan from the Minnesota Reformer, an article dated um, June 3rd, 2022, also states that um, he testified during the trial that he volunteered for Senator Fate's campaign on the day of, of the 2020 primary. When he showed up at the campaign office, he was taken to a back room and given three envelopes to deliver the elections uh, to the elections office because he didn't know the voters. He was unwittingly in violation of the law. Um, a couple of the statements that have been made are, were in the articles or and in the testimony were um, that it's implying there's a, an election office. Does Senator Fate, did Senator Fate operate an election office where these activities occurred? Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I will just note, I guess I have the same question as the previous article, I, if this article I don't believe was part of the record. So I, I would, I guess, initially start by saying I think it's improper to bring it up today if it is not part of the record. Uh, I think it's a fair point to say you've not been prepared for that. Uh, so I think the answer is we don't have an answer for Senator Coran to that question. Mr. Senator Chair, um, yeah, with that, Mr. Chair, then um, outside of that, the. The, all the testimony that's been um, published in a wide variety of documents um, have led that the, the, um, the scenario is pretty similar, that um, they were directed to an office who worked and volunteered on Senator Fate's campaign, and that they operated out of an office, um, in which Dawson Kimian was also a part of. 
Did Senator Fate, did he operate an election office during the 2020 primary campaign and 2020 general election? Senator Fate. Uh, yes, we did have a campaign office in Southside Minneapolis. Senator Coran. And was Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Fate. Was that the office then in which your primary campaign headquarters ran out of? In and Dawson Kim in was the primary person managing it. Senator Fate. Uh, that's correct. We did have an office in South Minneapolis, and um, Mr. Kim in was uh, the campaign manager. Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator. Um, so. What I'm trying to do is uh, understand that, that it was your office in which that they operated in, in which are referred to as these as your volunteers. Um, certainly, Musi Muhammad operated out of that office. Um, I was trying to find the um, that expense for uh, having a campaign office, um, and I didn't see that in campaign finance. It, was that office um, a shared facility? Was it donated to you, or was that? Um, something you paid for and rented. Senator Fate. Uh, Senator, uh, Senator Torres Ray, for what purpose do you rise? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. So now we're going to go into expense reports about the office and how they are filed. Um, what, what is the relevance of this question? To, to the point that we're trying to make with respect to these ballots. We're gonna, we're gonna go into the finance again. Who's paying for the finance and how is it reported? What is the relevance of that question, Mr. Chair? Uh, Senator Torres Ray, uh, I think that is, we are talking to the activity that took place regarding the voter fraud and its subject connection to the complaint itself. I think it's worthy of asking the question. I've already uh, ruled a couple of times that there's items not in the packet that uh, were out of line. Uh, I think this one is in line uh, for discussion and you can certainly debate me on that one. Um, I guess it's a question that sort of relates back to uh, count number one regarding campaign finance and a, perhaps a pattern that's taking place. Uh, but I'll let Senator Fate have his answer to this one. Um, and But I believe me, Senator Torres Ray, I'm being careful to make sure that we're staying to the subject of count two and the documentation provided. Again, individuals were told to provide documentation prior to this meeting. So if there's additional documentation, they should have already provided it so that both parties have an opportunity to discuss it. Senator Fate, or Sen Representative, I got you as a representative. <laughs> Ms. Kendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's exactly my response is there was nothing in the allegations listed out um, the many paragraphs of complaint number two about the campaign office or any allegation regarding um, anything to do with campaign finance in complaint number two. Um, and again, nothing in complaint number one um, that that spoke to or made any allegations about uh, an issue with any sort of office used or space used by the campaign. So again, um, because we do not have any one, we do not have any allegations uh, referencing that in any way, nor is there anything uh, in the record or in the evidence that's been provided um, to indicate that such an allegation would be made. Uh, again, I would argue that that question is improper. Mr. Chair, um, we're just trying to establish between um, those articles that were submitted um, by both uh, parties here, as well as all of the other public information that's been uh, produced since this has uh, become much more um, a prominent issue after the conviction, is just trying to establish, in, in everywhere it references, um, just trying to establish that um, Senator Fate's primary campaign and his campaign manager operated out of facility, which appears to be the base camp for um, this this particular conviction. And one, the most immediate place to be able to check that would be campaign finance to verify where those expenditures arrived. Where, one, where it was located, and two, where it was, where, that it, did it exist? Um, it appears it exists. Senator Fate just acknowledged that he operated out of an office 
and uh, not not many Senate campaigns operate out of an, uh, have an office. So I assumed that there would be some entry to try and validate that he did have an office. He since has verified he has had an office in which they operated out of. Ms. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in response, I would just note two, well, a few things, I guess. First of all, in terms of an office being a base camp for the conviction, um, as Senator Coran termed it, um, the conviction was for perjury before a grand jury. So the base camp for the conviction was the grand jury room. Um, and, and candidly, in terms of the allegations that are laid out in complaint two, I guess I don't really see why it would matter if they had an office or met in a, the Wabasha Street Caves or some other <laughs> uh, corner on the street when the allegations are surrounding, um, again, in complaint number two, the failure to expressly address involvement in unauthorized delivery of 2020 primary election ballots and retaining a Senate staff, uh, staff member. So again, not speaking out loudly or strongly enough according to the complainants or not acting quickly enough, apparently less than 24 hours is not quickly enough to act um, after allegations that are not even fully formed. When, when even reading the transcript of the Musa Muhammad trial, there are not even clear allegations against Dawson Kimian in the testimony that was provided. Um, his name came up, uh, but again, there were no actual specific allegations. There is just an inference that he had come up in the trial. So again, I, I will say that when we're talking about these allegations that are based on, as Senator Coran put it, leaked grand jury testimony and articles that are not sworn statements, we don't have again, we don't have any any sworn statements, any testimony that's being pointed to. Again, ultimately, the, the facts that we have, the actual um, information that we can look to is the fact that, yes, uh, Musa Muhammad was convicted of perjury, and Dawson Kimian, after his name came up in that trial, was uh, put on a leave of absence uh, pending an investigation that the, the DFL leadership decided was appropriate as well within 24 hours of said conviction. And then Senator Fata made statements against any sort of fraud and indicated that he was that he was as shocked as anyone else that this was being alleged and that there was any sort of a conviction that happened at all. Um, so again, I, I guess I come back to, I don't think that it is on point for the complaint number two, I don't think it matters where they were talking candidly. But again, any sort of uh, discussion of a campaign office is not something that was included in the complaint and not anything that was included in any sort of evidence that was presented. A uh, brief question to not to interrupt too much. Uh, so was the, uh, was, do we, are we aware that there was a complaint filed regarding this campaign? Um, um, center, I guess, or campaign headquarters during the primary that occurred in 2020? Was there any complaint filed with the Campaign Finance Board? No. Senator Fate? Sorry, no. Okay. Senator Coran? Senator Osmond, because just trying to establish that that, uh, that Senator Fate did operate out of a primary campaign location, um, was unable to determine that in public records, and with his campaign manager, it would make logical sense that um, those operating, supporting Senator Fateh's campaign, his brother-in-law, Musi Muhammad, um, as well as all the others, or any, any others, including his primary campaign manager for some time, um, operated out of that area or that space. That's all I was trying to establish. He confirmed that, yes, he had a campaign office, and, um, I, and I, I don't know where that was located because it's not um, documented. Again, it goes back to um, our campaign finance rules, yes, but I was looking for it, not from the violation there, but just from a perspective of trying to verify where that is. And I think it is, uh, it's 
rather it's a tangential, I think it's the best the word is tangential issue that goes along with the fact that the activity that's in complaint number two all occurred during the primary election in 2020 and activity took place during that entire election cycle. So I think we've established the connectivity uh, tangentially that there was a campaign office and I think we can move on from there. Senator Coran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, it, with that, um, I think the the evidence there and the, and the reaction or the lack of um, statements um, during this year-long investigation is multiple public sources that have, that have sought comment. And in addition to um, our obligation as leaders in the community or leaders in the, or leadership within this body um, that we are willingly and cooperating with leadership to make sure that we don't bring ill repute to the, Ill repute to the body. Um, that's the reason we're here. So um, I think the, what we need to do is, um, and this is a probable cause, so the public, we're not looking to do anything except uncover information um, to further um, push that I do believe that prove probable cause that uh, further an in-depth investigation um, along with gathering all of the uh, grand jury transcripts to make sure that um, that we clearly understand the complaint in number two or complaint number two and what we should, uh, how we should resolve that and ensure that no violations occurred. Any further questions, Senator? I have no Grant? further questions, Senator, uh, or Mr. Chair. Ms. Hendrick, questions for the uh, complainants? Mr. Chair, I don't have any questions. Okay. I do have, I would like to give a final statement, um, and I believe that Senator Fata mm -hmm. also would like to give a brief final statement. And when we get to that point, we're going a lot faster than count number one. Uh, for, now we're on to questions from members. Senator Torres Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Gendrick, I have a question that in number three of the complaint. It says that the FBI's investigation into the election fraud committed in 2020 primary election included 80 witnesses. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about um, that in terms of how long did it last? It, it seems like the conclusion is, or I don't know what the conclusion of that is, but it seems to me that it was a lengthy process. I, I just would like to understand what the conclusion of that investigation actually was. There, there is a, you know, in number three, it, it actually um, goes into M Mr. Mohammed's lied, but that's a separate thing. I just want to know about the investigation itself and how it ties to Senator Fateh. What was the conclusion of that? how lengthy it was, give us a perspective of what that is, because I don't know much about it. So if you could do that. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Torres Ray. Um, to answer your question, I, I was not involved with the grand jury. Um, I am not an assistant U.S. attorney, um, nor did I represent any of the witnesses uh, that testified. So I, I can't speak to that. I, I guess what I would say was that my understanding of that grand jury process was um, looking into potential widespread voter fraud that was alleged during the 2020 election. Um, and so throughout that, again, my understanding is that um, the witnesses that were interviewed as part of that grand jury process were from many campaigns um, across the board. That's, that's my personal understanding. Um, I will note again that the outcome in this instance was that the, from what we've seen, that the grand jury determined that based on uh, Mr. Muhammad's testimony that Musa Muhammad should be charged with perjury, which he was then later convicted of. Um, and I believe the transcript of that trial was something that was provided um, I know generally along with the complaint. I, I received that along with the complaint. Um, I will also note that to date, the outcome of that has been that neither Dawson, Kimian, nor Senator Fata have been charged with any crime. So I, again, that is all I can take from um, the grand jury, um, what I can see from the outside um, as, as we all can. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. 
Senator Ch uh, Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple questions. Um, maybe the last one first. So, so do you have any information or have you talked to anyone uh, 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 that may be involved with the investigation in order to conclude that the investigation is over? Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion. Um, we do not have any information or indication right now that either of the two, the two others that are obviously <coughs> implicated in this complaint, um, Dawson Kimian, we have no information that he has been charged with a crime, um, and we also have no information um, that Senator Fata has been or, or is being charged with a crime. And my next Senator question Champion. is, um, I know earlier that it was asked um, whether uh, Senator Fate, you know, participated in any way, and you answered it very narrowly by saying he has not been subpoenaed. Has he uh, sat voluntarily uh, uh, before an investigator or U.S. Attorney's Office or anyone in particular, if you can share that? Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion, um, no, Senator uh, Fateh has not been requested to testify um, in any capacity. And not just Senator testify, but, but, but even just to sit down with, with investigators. None of that has happened? Ms. Hendrick? Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, no, he has not been asked to make a statement um, or, or, or come in to provide information, no. And, and my last champion. question, well, it might be my last question. You know how we are as lawyers. We always say it's our last question. Then we always have another question. because <laughs> you get paid by the word. Senator Champion. Okay. Um, um, uh, has Senator Fate uh, conducted any internal investigations of his own office, especially since or even before uh, Mr. Moose Muhammad, you know, got indicted or at least there were allegations that he was dishonest to the grand jury? Um, and it's my understanding that since then, there's also been a naming of uh, potentially um, uh, his then campaign manager who, you know, ended up, you know, coming to, you know, work in the Senate and do uh, good, good work here. Has there been any internal investigations from the office in order to get to, to the bottom of, of whether there was or could potentially have been um, some things being done that should not have been done? Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion. Um, I will start by just noting again that Musa Muhammad was charged with and convicted of perjury to the grand jury. Um, the allegations, the charges, the conviction were not related to um, any sort of ballot fraud um, type charge. Um, obviously, as we've already stated, uh, Senator Fata was shocked that any sort of allegation even of that nature would come up to someone re related to him in any way. Um, again, after, it was after the trial. So Senator Fata was not involved in that trial of Musa Muhammad. He didn't attend it. He learned about the trial through the news like everyone else. And so in f his following of the news and following a, um, learning of the conviction of Musa Muhammad, he also did learn that, again, if you read the transcript of the trial, um, it's not even the full name Dawson Kimian that comes up. It's someone refers to a Dawson. It's not clarified in testimony, anything else about who this Dawson is. We can all look at it and say Dawson is maybe Maybe we can figure out who we might think it is, but again, it isn't even specific in the testimony um, who that Dawson is. But again, a Dawson came up um, within the testimony. There really aren't any specific allegations even in that transcript about this Dawson. Simply, he's referenced um, throughout in the testimony. Um, and so again, when Senator Fata learned that Dawson's name came up, um, that was the first time that he learned through the news, like everybody else, of any implication of Dawson. Um, and again, I will just note that within 24 hours of learning of that and learning of the conviction, that's the afternoon of the 10th, on the morning of the 11th, um, along with uh, 
Senate DFL leadership, Dawson Kimian, was placed on uh, a leave of absence for there to be some sort of an investigation done and so that a transcript could be obtained. Um, as you and I both know, transcripts take a little bit of time, especially when they're that length. Um, so again, they wanted time to be able to actually have an investigation because there had not been any sort of allegation or implication against uh, Dawson Kimian prior to that. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your, for, for your answer. And I'm, I'm just probing a little just because I want to give you the space to, you know, think about these things, but also answer some really, I think, important questions. Um, uh, like, for an example, if I'm shocked, then my shock leads to action, right? I do something, right? Uh, and if there's too many connections, then I need to do some investigation of my own front yard in order to kind of get a better sense of what's right or wrong. Like if you have a volunteer and they are making the, the connection of that volunteer and the person who's been indicted to my campaign, if they're naming a person with a not kind of an unusual name, right? It's not a common name like Bobby, right? So you start, and, and then I had one on my campaign. I got to start asking some questions just so I'm clear as to what may or may not happen so I can, um, as a candidate, just make sure that uh, my values are reflected in my in inquiry to try to get to the bottom of it, even if it's just internally. I'm not talking about for anyone else's purposes. I'm talking about for my own purposes because I want to understand because I believe uh, Senator F uh, Fate wants to be known as a credible and, and integrity, integrity filled person. And if you have something that's hanging out there that is, that is casting a shadow over your mm -hmm. value system, your work, then I would think that you might want to do something in order to kind of figure out what is right or wrong just so that you know what you want to do going forward because guess what, every moment is what I call a teachable moment. You know, what can I learn from this set of circumstances that I need to be aware of for, for the future? So that's why I'm asking that question. And here's the last thing connected to this. Perjury is important, it's big, right? Because it's not just about being dishonest, it's about the, the fact that you went in some place under oath mm -hmm. and said something, right? And there was that nexus between you, Mr. Muse Muhammad, and potentially Fatah's campaign. How do we reconcile those two things and help me so that I, I can help articulate with clarity what should or should not be the order of the day before this committee. So I hope that wasn't too convoluted and you understand my, my two long-winded long, long questions. Uh, reactions, uh, Ms. Hendrick? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Senator Champion, um, in responding to the two questions as I, as I understand them. Um, Sorry about that, go ahead. I would first note that, yes, uh, Senator Fata did take action um, and has been involved in his campaign. One, Dawson Kimian is no longer on his campaign. Again, I will note that um, Dawson Kimian to date has not been charged with any crime. Um, and again, in the reading of the transcript of the Musa Muhammad trial, Dawson Kimian's name comes up, but again, there are no specific allegations made against Dawson Kimian um, in that transcript itself. So in terms of the evidence that is that is before us today, um, there isn't any evidence of specific wrong wrongdoing on Dawson Kimian's part, and there's no charges to date that have been filed. Um, however, given the, the desire, the need to um, maintain uh, the appearance of and to, to show, again, his integrity and to show that he doesn't want that on his campaign, as he also noted in his statement following the conviction, um, I, I will just point to the statement that's even quoted in paragraph seven that Senator Fata said that he was troubled by the conviction. He takes the, the seriousness of 
he, he takes the perjury charge and conviction very seriously. He's troubled by it. He's shocked by it because, again, he had no indication that something was was a miss potentially on his campaign. So. Um, again, I mean, he noted even in that statement that he was more committed than ever to organizing and um, governing to strengthen a free and fair democracy, but also um, that he was very committed to upholding the state's election laws and processes. So he has he's reaffirmed in that that he is committed to the process and to following the law. Um, so I, I believe that answers the first question about the campaign itself. Um, Additionally, I will just note when the, the discussion is of a nexus, obviously, yes, um, it was a person associated to Senator Fata, associated to his campaign that was charged with and convicted ultimately of perjury. Again, as I've noted already, Senator Fata was shocked by that. I um, was shocked and dismayed that, that, would, that someone associated with his campaign with him um, would would be in that situation and would be um, would have charges like that brought against them and ultimately be convicted of that. Um, I will just note, though, that again, within the transcript from that trial, within any sort of public record, any information we have, there have not been any further criminal charges brought against anyone else within the campaign. Um, or Senator Fata. So again, right now there is no, um, no allegations outlined before the committee of any wrongdoing on Senator Fata's part or any indication of any direction on his part for wrongdoing um, or instruction for any wrongdoing to take place. A uh, couple of questions, and Senator Kiffmeyer is going to ask some questions. I just want to clarify a couple points. Um, so at what at what date, or can you get, give us an idea, Senator Fate, when Dawson Kimian was re relieved of his duties on your campaign? Do you have an exact date? Do you have a month? Uh, the campaign and not the Senate, correct? The to cam the campaign. I'm coming to the Senate next, but okay. when did, when, as your campaign manager, when was Dawson Kimian relieved of his duties? Um, I believe the same day he was put on leave. And when that would have been uh, May twenty May tenth, twenty twenty two? No, the eleventh. Eleven, sorry. Uh, yep. The, number, the, number six under but, administrative leave. But but the documentation wouldn't reflect that till later. Yep. I understood. And second question. I can't remember, but I think I may have heard this that uh, he no longer is your legislative assistant. Is he currently your legislative assistant or has he been relieved of those duties also? Or is he a, did he leave on his own? He has since resigned. He resigned. Okay, thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the question that I have here is, um, it's been um, stated here that somehow the conviction of Mr. Muhammad has no relation uh, to what's going on here. And I just want to take this from, again, submitted uh, Minneapolis man, Mr. Muhammad, was on trial for lying to a grand jury lying to a grand jury about the involvement in delivering absentee ballots without the voters' consent, claiming an agent delivery, which I have the Secretary of State's website here in regards to the requirements uh, that must be met for that. And in the process of lying about that, rather than making a statement, he preferred to be convicted of perjury than to state more. But one little piece of it that did come out, he stated that a campaign official named Dawson gave him a list of three voters in question whom he later acted as an agent for. And according to Minnesota law, um, I don't see that sort of process. But again, I don't have some documents here. So there is a connection because I don't know how many campaign officials that are named Dawson are under uh, or with Senator Fate's campaign, so it's a logical conclusion. And then put on administrative leave, even though saying he's not been uh, charged or other things, um, and that you're just troubled by this. I would concur with Senator Champion's statement that uh, in this situation, to do your own questioning, 
about what happened with your campaign. You're responsible for your campaign and everything that happens with it. So you have a campaign staff person named Dawson, a campaign office, and um, activities that were claimed to have gone on there, and yet your lack of inaction for yourself to say, you know, what happened here in an area that I am responsible for, the hiring and paying of your campaign manager, your office, and other things like that. And so the issue here is ethics, and the ethics of the work um, that is at question here leaves many, many, many more questions than I could ever ask here today without the ability to get additional documents or facts that um, would be able to clear the ethical behavior one way or the other. And I think that that is um, the connection, Senator Fateh, to you, to your campaign, to your campaign staffer, uh, then a legislative assistant working for you, um, an office that appears to be in this situation, to having a connection to this um, campaign. And so there's a lot of things that are connected to you, Senator Fateh, a lot of them. Uh, indirectly, maybe we don't know about directly because there has been no um, additional documentation provided one way or the other. And so with that kind of questions that I see here, um, that's a very important ethical issue for us in the Senate and the ethical standards that we have here. So there is, without a question though, there are more questions. And I think it's very important that we be able to have those answers before we can determine uh, the situation here of ethical conduct. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Response, Ms. Hendrick. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, in response or trying to parse out if there is a, a question in that statement, um, I will just note a couple of things. One, um, I believe a couple of things you said were misstated because in the transcript of the trial, uh, Dawson did give a list of, it's, it's noted that, that a Dawson gave a list of names to go and door knock for. Um, and again, Dawson's name did not come up until trial. As soon as Dawson's name came up at trial and that conviction was entered within 24 hours, the next morning, the afternoon of the 10th to first thing in the morning of the 11th, the next morning Dawson is put on a leave of absence. The choice to put him on a leave of absence versus immediately firing him or something of that nature was made by DFL Senate leadership. Rightly so, I, I would imagine, this is my assumption, that they determined it was appropriate to have some sort of an investigation as opposed to just firing him on the spot because his name came up at the trial. They had no transcript yet, none, nothing of that nature. There was no official allegation, um, no transcript to review the morning of the 11th. Uh, there was also no criminal charge that was pending. Um, so they put him on a leave of absence. That was done um, outside of actual Senator Fatah's control. Um, he was made aware of it, was in agreement with it. And that's, that is what happened. Um, I will also note um, that you did, you, you brought up things happening within a campaign. Obviously, there are things that can be done leadership-wise within a campaign. There can be best practices, and that's what Senator Fata has, has reiterated, both in his statement, I'm in here today, we're reiterating, that he's committed to, that he's committed to running a campaign um, that even if you go to the statement that's, that upholds the state's election laws. Um, so ag again, he is committed to running that kind of campaign. That has been the leadership he had in his campaign, the direction he gave. Just like any other area, I mean, Senator Kiffmeyer, if you had a campaign volunteer who then decided they got really riled up by someone you mentioned last week um, at a fair, and they've got their cotton candy and their 4-H milkshake, but they're really riled up, and they decide to punch someone in the face of their own accord, even though they're your volunteer. Once someone commits a criminal act, 
that, that cuts things off. Now they're on their own island with their criminal act. So again, the, yes, it is, Senator Fata is concerned, shocked, as we've mentioned, as he's mentioned, that any sort of an allegation came out against Musa Muhammad because that's not the type of campaign that he, um, within his leadership, was running. And so for there to be any sort of an allegation, any sort of a question was shocking to him. Um, but again, ultimately, as we've stated before, he did not direct any sort of uh, criminal act or behavior to happen. He did not condone anything. He did not encourage anything directly or indirectly to happen that was not above board. Um, so to that end, when it comes to an ethics complaint against Senator Fata personally, we're not here today with an ethics complaint against Musa Mohammed or against Dawson Kimian. We're here because of an ethics complaint that was lodged against Senator Fata. Ultimately, we have to look at his behavior and the complaint that, as it is listed, lists out his behavior. And the behavior that is listed in here is him not coming out in what is deemed to be a strong enough manner quickly enough against Dawson Kimian or against uh, Musa Muhammad, it would seem. So again, he did come out and make statements against that type of allegation and behavior, indicating that that's not something that he condoned on his, um, on his campaign or with people around him. And again, he, he right away, within 24 hours, had Dawson Kimian on a leave of absence. So Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was an action of the Senate, not of Senator Fateh, right? So it is the Senate who took the ethical step in the light of the information that they had at the time. It was the Senate, and to the Senate's credit, uh, to the staff, to the leadership, who made that ethical step. It was not a decision of the senator um, who had this person working for them. So to the credit of the Senate and that ethical standard. I have a question, though, for Senator Fateh. Senator, would you please explain to me what you mean by troubled by this conviction? What would you describe being troubled about? Uh, we'll go to Senator Fateh next. Sen uh, Ms. Hendrick, I have it even written down now. Uh, she wanted to comment, and then we'll go to an answer with Senator Fates. Ms. Hendrick? Thank you. I, I believe there were two questions there. The one was specifically to Senator uh, Fata, which I will defer to him to answer. But first and foremost, um, Senator Kiffmeyer, um, you did note, uh, or you asked the question of whether it was uh, Senate leadership that put Dawson Kimina on the leave of absence or Senator Fata. I didn't ask the question, to be clear. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was a statement. But, but yes, um, in response, it was Senate, the DFL Senate leadership that put him on the leave of absence. However, I would say that it is an unfair characterization to say that Senator Fata, therefore, did not take any action. This was something between late afternoon of the 10th until 8 a.m. the following morning. So he was not given an opportunity to react. Again, and between 4.30 p.m. on the 10th and 8 a.m. on the 11th, there was still no specific allegation against Dawson Kimian. There was still no criminal charge pending and no access, obviously, yet to any sort of a court transcript. Again, there was a concern that his name had come up. Senator Fata had reached out to others um, to determine what steps he should take, and action was taken by 8 a.m. the following morning, again, in less than 24 hours after the conviction. But I'll turn to Senator no, Fata to time, answer your question. Mr. Chair, I will clarify Senator, what I Senator said, Kittmer. that um, it is the Senate who took that action, not Senator Fata. That is what I said. And so that is a factual statement that I made. But as to, the, uh, to you, Senator Fata, would you describe what you mean by troubled and what was troubling to you? Senator Fate. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Kefmeyer. Um, I'd just like to add also that um, while the Senate leadership did place him on leave, that I immediately um, spoke with him about um, no longer being a part of the campaign um, as a manager or any capacity for that matter. Um, so I took care of both the Senate side and um, the campaign side just to make that 
uh, clear. Um, I was extremely troubled because we worked really, really hard um, to run our campaign with the utmost integrity. And um, as uh, Ms. Hendricks stated, um, she stated that we, uh, I did not directly or indirectly encourage anybody to um, act improperly at any point, whether it's um, voting or absentee ballots or um, uh, any part of the electoral process. So that's why I was troubled. Um, I was also horrified, um, like all of you, when the news came out, um, when the allegations came out, and when the conviction happened. Um, both because it was part of my campaign, but um, it was extremely hurtful that um, it was a family member, um, someone that I cared about, someone I still care about, and someone that I'll always care about. Um, so for me, that was extremely hurtful. So for both sides, um, I was troubled. Senator Kipmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate that, but I will go back to uh, the question that Senator Champion asked. When somebody is troubled and horrified, there's more actions to document than just firing somebody as your campaign manager or the Senate doing that. Um, the whole point here is uh, what happened within the campaign office by this person and all of that. I will leave it at that, Mr. Chair, because I think there are many more things here that the more I go into this, um, there are more questions and more things that um, right now what I'm hearing a lot of is intentions or interpretations, but I'm not seeing the facts that I would like to see if I were truly to make a decision. Thank you. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to be clear, you know, my questions were really to try to, you know, make sure that there's space given for Senator Fatai to, you know, sort of talk about, you know, his, his thought process, because I always like for that to be a part of the record and out front. Uh, my question, though, is going to go to Senator Coran and also Senator Newman, perhaps because I see Senator Newman sitting there and I haven't heard anything from him in this aspect of things, so they can decide which one will answer this question. Um, how does the conviction of a campaign volunteer for uh, perjury, and, and even though they're a campaign volunteer for Senator Fate's uh, campaign, um, and they get convicted, and, but again, I heard not under the direction or, or knowledge of Senator Fate, how does that violate the ethical rules of the Senate? And so I would like for you to look at uh, paragraph number nine and help us understand that, because I've heard a, a number of different things about you know, whether something was directly or indirectly, and I just want to know what you're thinking and how you formulated this uh, notion that his action betrays the public trust and brings the Senate into dishonor and disrepute. Who would like that? Uh, Senator Osnick, or Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll go first, and if Senator Newman would like to add to that. So when, when we look at, and Senator Champion, as you wrote it, to um, Senator Fate's failure to unequivocally refute his involvement. Um, it relates to, I, I think, again, all the elements that lead up to the conversation here. Um, the charge of the conviction was perjury, but the underlying complaint is election fraud. And so the seriousness of that, I think, is thus why we're here today and trying to figure out, do you reasonably know or do you have a role in uh, things that occurred within your office and what are you aware of and what aren't you aware of? Um, and that's why we're here today, to prove that probable cause. And, and that's what I was trying to establish. Um, is it an office? Is your office there? In multiple statements, um, it's referred to um, Dawson, which appears to um, be the only Dawson that works in the office um, of Senator Fate. And the the components or the other elements that go into it are you know kind of what did he reasonably know should he have known um senator fate made a statement that um he was aware of wasn't aware of the trial or the investigation until he read it in the news um we're talking about his brother-in-law and so and somebody who's working on his campaign diligently he's in many different videos and ads and and consistently it doesn't appear it was a one time stop in and and uh, provide a day of service and so that's what we're here to 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 prove 
um, that there's enough unknown or enough questions there that we should go into a full-blown investigation um, because I think there's enough probable cause because of the seriousness of not the conviction. The conviction ties to the office, but the underlying is really election fraud and what role and what was known at the time that that occurred. And I do think, you know, there's probably yet to be a lot more discovered in that particular scenario as well. I think the FBI investigation, I think the U.S. attorney, I mean, and, and Senator Kiffmeyer, I think, stated that um, Mr. Muhammad took the perjury charge to protect those in an office which appears to uh, could be closely related to Senator Fateh's election office and certainly his campaign manager. And so I think there's enough uh, there there to warrant a future or a, a formal investigation to determine the actual role when everything was actually known and the actions that were taken. Because the underlying case is really election fraud, and what does that bring to the institution? And none of us, I agree, all of us, um, want to make sure that doesn't occur at any level in, in any role in this body or this institution. Senator Newman, anything to add? The only thing I'd add, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Champion, is uh, taken by itself, the conviction of uh, uh, Moose Muhammad uh, would not rise to the level of probable cause. But there's a series of coincidences uh, involving Senator Fateh's campaign and his campaign office that, that when taken as a whole, those, con those coincidences uh, do rise to the level of probable cause uh, which should result in further investigation. That's all we're talking about here is, is probable cause. We're not trying to determine the truth or falsity, just the probable cause, whether or not investigation should proceed. Uh, who would like, I'm sure there's a response coming. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will just uh, just briefly respond to a few different things. One, um, Senator Coran has stated that Senator Fate testified today that he did not know about the trial till he saw it in the newspaper. He, he did not testify to that fact. He did not get involved in the trial. He did not testify at the trial. He did not know the contents of the testimony. He did not attend the trial. So he learned about any contents of the testimony, anything that happened in the trial, in the news the same way that everybody else did. Um, but again, it, it's not that obviously that he was shocked that there was some trial happening. He learned again of the allegations, my understanding of a, uh, and, and I believe all of a grand jury is that generally those are closed and people are instructed not to speak about them. So until there are any charges filed, um, obviously he learned about those charges then, but again, learned about the contents of other, of testimony at trial, things like that like everybody else said in the news because he did not attend the trial and was not involved in the trial. I will also bring up the fact that it was stated that you're trying to look into then with this inquiry uh, whether or not Senator Fata reasonably knew or had a role in any sort of election fraud in his campaign. Again, he has, uh, since we keep talking about these equivocations, he has very unequivocally stated that he had no direct or indirect encouragement or direction to anyone in his campaign to do anything improper with voting, absentee balloting, or any part of the electoral process. The proof, I would say, is that there are no charges filed against Dawson Kimian, but more importantly, because the person who's on the hot seat today is Senator Fata, there's no charges filed against him um, that he had any sort of action like that in his case. And no charges have been filed by the assistant U.S. attorney or any other agency making allegations that he did. They are the agencies that have obviously all of their grand jury testimony that they took Candidly, I think if they had a case that they could make, they would bring it, and they have not. So uh, what, when we're asked to then say, well, should we go forward? Is there probable cause to go forward? Um, should the subcommittee continue going into this? I would say that while well, the assistant U.S. attorneys have looked into it and haven't charged him with something. Um, 
again, when you're talking about though also now whether or not there's some allegation of wrongdoing on his part, the complaint in front of the subcommittee today says that there is an ethical complaint before the subcommittee indicating that Senator Fata violated Senate rules by failing to expressly address his involvement in the unauthorized delivery of the 2020 primary election absentee ballots and retaining his Senate staffer who reportedly directed the fraudulent election activity. And then going through all of the paragraphs one through nine, when we look at what the allegations are, again, I would say on its face, this should be dismissed today and concluded with no probable cause to proceed because again, what these complaints are going to is the actions of others, a conviction of, an, of another individual, of Musa Muhammad, for perjury, um, and, and also allegations that Senator Fatah did not act swiftly enough or loudly enough in um, coming out against Musa Muhammad, an individual, or um, acting swiftly enough to get rid of Dawson Kimian when his name came up, which again, um, even looking at the dates that are listed in the complaint itself show a very quick turnaround one afternoon to the next morning before Dawson is out the door. Senator Fata has also testified that he swiftly, again that next day, took Dawson off of his campaign. And again, um, I will just point out again, he came out and even as is listed in paragraph 17 of the complaint, came out against the actions um, of Musa Muhammad and any allegations of actions that had been levied. But again, to date, the people who have all of the information, those assistant US attorneys who had all of their grand juries and everything have not brought any criminal charges against Senator Fatah, most importantly, nor against Dawson Kimian. And therefore, I, I don't think there's any basis to go forward with a, an ethics uh, investigation against Senator Fatah. Senator Champion. Just so that I'm clear, so Ms. <coughs> Ms. Hendrick, are you suggesting that the only time an ethics complaint should go forward is if it meets the high burden and standard of a criminal case? Because there's a different standard of proof for a criminal case, and it sounds like that's what you're advocating, saying, hey, if there's no charges, then it shouldn't be any ethics deal, right? Then, then you know, and I know, that if that was the case, where would civil cases fall? Where will all these other things fall? So I just want to make sure I'm not putting words in your mouth and giving you some space because that, that appears to me to be what you're advocating for, saying that if uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, cannot meet the burden of proof of being able to prove someone guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then the Senate should not have any grounds or any space by which to go forward with an ethics complaint because no one's been charged. So can you speak to that and help give me some clarity around that? Ms. Hendrick. Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, thank you for the question. Um, I am not saying that an ethics complaint should only go forward if there's a criminal charge attached to it. Um, and, and I appreciate you bringing the question if, it, if that's how it came across. What I'm simply stating is that in the record before the subcommittee today, there's nothing in the evidence that points to, indicates, alleges any sort of direct or indirect encouragement or direction on the part of Senator Fata. Uh, to any member of his campaign, any volunteer, uh, to do anything improper with voting, absentee balloting, or any part of the electoral process. Anything that has been provided, um, even the transcript from Musa Muhammad's trial, there's no indication Senator Fatah's name doesn't come up with any sort of allegation or inference or, or anything of that nature. So there's nothing before the subcommittee today showing any sort of link in that way or any sort of direction, any sort of an ethical issue um, to that end. Furthermore, Senator Kiffmeyer earlier said, well, I, we need evidence, we need proof. I would say the other evidence or proof that you can look to is not only is there nothing that could be brought by the complainants to the subcommittee today showing any sort of direction or showing any um, ethical violation on Senator Fata's part. But additionally, others who have looked into this same issue 
have not brought any charges. So none of this was brought up in Musa Muhammad's trial. None of this was um, in, from any other forum brought before the subcommittee today by the complainants. And additionally, there have been no uh, charges filed at this time. So um, I'm going to make a couple of comments um, and see if there are any additional questions. And you can decide if you want to respond to them. Um, first, regarding the uh, suspension and termination and the demand for a strong statement or whatever the case might be. Um, <clears throat> I don't necessarily consider that terribly strong uh, from a point of view of, um, did you scream loud enough? Um, I don't know if some people think that we should, you know, that Senator Fate should have gotten a guillotine out and lopped his head off to prove the fact that he was upset with the situation. I know that's a bit graphic, uh, but I think in the direction based upon the information I think Senator Fate probably took and the DFL Senate caucus probably took the right actions in dealing with the situ situation when they became aware of it. Um, that being said, uh, here's where the problem comes in. Um, and it bleeds back to case number one. Uh, Mr. Mr. Kenyon um, was an employee of the campaign was campaign we've established he was the campaign manager uh, I pulled up the campaign finance report for Senator Fate for 2020 and this individual has paid forty two thousand dollars worth of employee expenses and that's how it's been categorized. with one exception that's been how it's pretty much been categorized um, that's fairly significant to note um, that still does not necessarily mean that that Mr. Uh, Mr. Kenyon did anything wrong because he has not been charged, and is a perfectly fair statement to make. I'll add one word yet. Uh, we don't know what the federal government's going to do. Um, it's impo entirely possible come August, July, sometime in the future, it's entirely possible there may be some action taken against him, but we can't necessarily believe that that is going to happen or won't happen. But it is very troubling that someone who was connected was paid by the treasurer of the campaign, which is Senator Fate, who happens to be the candidate, and this type of behavior took place. It brings disrepute upon the body that someone is employed and has been connected with which and I think many people would think is a horrible violation of the electoral process. Um, again, that has not been established. The fingerprints, so to speak, are not there, but the connectivity is being drawn. Um, but he is not, he is, he is innocent until proven guilty as everyone is. The other concern that I have is now it has been brought to light that there was a purchased or paid for or not paid for, because again, I looked at the expenses in the campaign finance report, there is no reference to this campaign office that has now been established by Senator Fate that that office existed. And I think there's at least one senator up here actually said it's very, rather rare than a Senate, off, senator, can, Senate campaign actually pays for an office because uh, I've always thought, as a candidate, it's a waste of money because uh, you want to make voter contact and an office is rarely used. Um, but this is very troubling that Mr. Kenyon was paid $42,000 plus. The activity that has been described by Mr. Muhammad as taking place took place, apparently, at this campaign office, which we've established has been paid for, but not showing up at a campaign finance report. So the early part of this in talking about, you know, the, the culpability of Mr. Kimian, where that is, I don't think necessarily we have a lot of basis to connect. But I do say we have now established a second, rec and it's, we're approaching now reckless disregard 
in my opinion. That's a that's a that's a legal terminology. I don't throw I throw I don't throw around lightly. But we've now established multiple issues regarding campaign finance and not paying for services and including them in your campaign finance report, which are obvious. Obvious as the nose on anyone's face. Um, when people, and I've been through this, and I've actually checked people's campaign finance reports, when you are sharing an office, you have to identify how much the rent is, how long you have it, the monthly costs, and the footage you are using, especially and particularly when it comes to um, if you're dealing with a federal race versus a state-level race, there's a number of different issues that goes on there. But now we have another instance that is a um, pattern. I won't say it's, it's as, as evil terminology as I've described, but a pattern that is very concerning that I think the committee may have to deal with and um, not sure where we're going with this. I don't see anybody else raising their hands for questions, so we may be getting close to final statements. Um, but I will say this, and you certainly respond, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kendrick. I, I have a very deep concern that we've now, as a process, uncovered another probable campaign finance violation. Um, and that continued pattern does bring disrepute upon this body. Um, comments, Ms. Kendrick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I will just first and foremost note, in terms of any sort of a question about the office, again, that was not part of the complaint. I, I don't have documentation to speak to, obviously, in front of me today, because that is not something that was brought up until this morning as we've been sitting here. So there was no um, indication that we needed to provide any sort of documentation related to um, any sort of office space or uh, meeting space that was used. I will just briefly respond um, in terms of the pay of Dawson Kimian. It's my understanding that that $42,000 of total pay was for 11 months of work as a manager, which would equate to about $3,800 per month. Um, so again, when it's when actually taken in context of the length of employment, um, it, it's not, it, again, it's $3,800 per month. I, I will let anyone um, draw their own thoughts or conclusions about whether or not they feel $3,800 is a good amount or not. But Ms. Um, Hendrick, I'm not even complaining about that. Okay. I, just because it was brought up, I thought I would address that as well, the, the term of time that that covered. True, but um, also you have to admit that he was, Mr. Kenyon was an employee of the campaign during the time where if he is connected now to the Mohammed voter fraud situation, he was an employee of the campaign and, per, and possibly participating. We're not sure yet, and that's not a fair statement to make. That's the point I'm trying to make. And, Mr. Chair, I, yes, um, I don't think there has been any question raised about whether or not Dawson Kimian was an employee of the campaign, was a legislative assistant. Um, but again, I will just note that before the subcommittee right now, the allegations relate to the perjury of, of Musa Muhammad, that allegation, charge, and conviction. And then furthermore, um, about the fact that this Dawson Kimmins name came up in the trial. Again, not associated, now that we have the benefit of having the transcript, not associated with any specific allegations. There's no indication in the transcript from the trial that anyone even said that Dawson Kimmins uh, di directly or indirectly encouraged any sort of um, improper voting or absentee balloting. Simply, I believe the transcript states that uh, Dawson Kimmins' name comes up because he provided lists of people to go and door knock at their homes. Um, and so the people, the individuals that testified, uh, the other individuals, the, the voters that testified, if you will, at the Musa Muhammad trial were people, were voters that were on this list 
that Dawson, um, that Dawson, again, we are inferring that it's Dawson Kimian, that Dawson provided of people to go and door knock at their, their homes. So again, I just will circle back to there, there isn't even now any direct or indirect encouragement or direction on the part of Dawson Kimian. I hate to bring that because he's, this isn't about him today. I understand he's related and all of these things, but, but again, he's not the one with an ethics violation before the subcommittee today. So, but there is no direct or indirect encouragement on his part and definitely not on the part of Senator Fata or any direction to do anything improper with voting, absentee balloting, or any part of the electoral process. So again, when we're talking about um, the allegations before the subcommittee and these ethics complaints, we're looking at, again, perjury. No, there wasn't, there weren't, like we've said, there weren't even uh, charges of election fraud brought against Musa Muhammad. He was charged with perjury convicted of that, but again, stemming from that and from the whole grand jury process, there have been no charges, no inferences within the trial or anything else beyond the trial that state that Senator Fatah had any sort of connection to any of that behavior. Any further questions from the panel? Senator Champion. Just one question for clarity because I've heard you say it a couple times and I just want to make sure that, that we get, make the, the record clean and you have a chance to speak to it. Um, was there another person working for the campaign with the name Dawson who would have been responsible for uh, giving a list to Mr. Muhammad? Ms. Hendrick? Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, um, it's my understanding that there was no other Dawson who was working for the campaign. I'm simply noting that when I say that, as we've already um, as we've already noted, we can all guess who this Dawson who was referred to probably was. I'm simply noting that it was not clarified in the trial or anywhere else in that testimony. Obviously, if there had been lawyers like you and I there, maybe we would have followed up with the questions to fully clarify who this Dawson was. Unfortunately, the people who had that trial did not. But we can guess who it is. Again, it just isn't, I don't want to misstate what's in that transcript or um, in that record, because again, there isn't any clarification in that record that it is Dawson Kimian, although we can guess that it is. Senator Champion. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Any further questions from the panel? Closing statements, uh, Senator Mr. Mr. Chair, just to that to that comment of the question, uh, clarification to um, Senator Champion is that um, I think it is really clear, and I think it it's been continually misstated in the response that um, that Mr. Muhammad stated in his uh, official testimony that he was given a list of three people by Dawson, not a list of people that door knock, and so it was stated multiple times in response to a couple of questions from from the committee members that they were given door knock lists and that's clearly not what the testimony says they were given exclusively three ballots and then uh, it's agent you know really implying it's the agency agent voting process which is very well defined by statute process and especially in the relationship so I just want to make that clarif clarification prior to us moving into closing statements further comments before we begin closing statements on article 2 uh, do you want to hold it for your final statement, or do you want to respond now? Just a, a brief response to that. To that Ms. Hendrick? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, I will just briefly respond in saying that that is not actually what is in the transcript from the trial. That's how it was summarized within the news article. Um, but again, within the trial as well, I, not to open another can of worms, but within the trial as well, the process for absentee ballot, balloting was testified to by um, individuals with uh, with the elections committee. I, I'm right now um, forgetting the name of the individual who worked for the state who testified, but um, who did indicate that there is definitely a process in place to for people to receive absentee ballots. They have to provide their driver's license uh, or their social security number, and it is provided directly to that voter themselves. But Again, in specific response uh, to the statement, to the question, I will just note that 
again, part of the transcript, um, I believe, does say that it was Dawson who gave the list for door knocking. Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, maybe this is more of a question for you or Senate Council. Um, I went back and I looked, at, and I'm looking at the document list because I've heard this stated a couple of times about the transcript, the transcript, the transcript. Um, I don't see the transcript listed uh, as any evidence um, or, or a part of the document list. So. Um, since there's been lots of testimony about that, what are, we, what are we to do with that? Because we don't have, or I don't have, I have not reviewed uh, the transcript, and there's been lots of uh, referencing of that transcript. Um, Mr. Bodron, you want to you hit that one? Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, certainly the grand jury transcript has been referred to, I think, in some of the media articles that have been submitted um, in document form to the subcommittee, but Senator Champion, you're correct. The, the subcommittee does not have a copy of the transcript. Um, in the way of options, I could suggest to the subcommittee if, if that's something that you feel is important for the subcommittee to look at. Um, certainly, steps could be taken to obtain a copy and provide it to the subcommittee. And Senator Champion, that would make that would require us to move beyond probable cause into investigation. That's another reason why we haven't had. Um, the individual from Somali TV here is that uh, unless he comes here on his own accord, we would need to go to an, the investigation phase. So we're trying to carp compartmentalize this into um, probable cause and then any investigation we need to take place. So uh, we would have to move forward into that phase. Senator Champion. Mr. Chair, of course you are doing a really good job as chair, but I want to t turn to Senate Council and ask whether uh, we need to go into uh, an investigation in order to get the transcript, or is it possible for us just to say that we want the, the transcript as a, part of, um, as a part of the documents we are using for our consideration as to whether we go to the next step or not? So I think the answer is I can subpoena it if necessary. That would be the way we'd go about it. Mr. Bonner? Mr. Chairman, I'm not certain, but I think the grand jury testimony or transcript, rather, is something that's publicly available. It's not necessary to subpoena it. Um, others could confirm that. Um, Senator Champion, to your question, the subcommittee's decision to look for additional documentary evidence would be, um, in effect, a decision to proceed with investigation. But traditionally, the way the subcommittee has proceeded is that each step in that investigation is something the subcommittee agrees collectively to proceed with. Um, I just want to clarify for you that a decision to look at that would not be um, necessarily an open-ended authorization of any and all investigation. The, the subcommittee has a lot of latitude in the way of shaping um, what it might want to look at in addition to what has been presented by the complainants and by Senator Pate. Um, I hope that's helpful. So, so Mr. Champion. Chair, uh, um, I think that we should agree to take a look at the um, transcript before making the decision as to whether additional information is needed because there's been a, a number of, of references made to the transcript in today's proceedings. Um, so Senator Champion, I, I am moving closer to um, moving as soon as we've complete item two and having final closing statements from both sides, I'm moving very close to asking for a vote for an executive session so we can proceed on what we consider what we want to take as far as next steps. Uh, I would prefer to do that because I think we can talk more freely than we can do during a, it will be recorded, uh, but we can talk more freely about where we want to go uh, if we want to go forward and that does take a vote to move forward. So uh, any further questions from the panel? Seeing none, uh, we will have final closing statements for the entire uh, complaint. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, we appreciate the committee's uh, patience and participation in, in allowing us to uh, present before you. Um, in closing, so we'll start out with uh, complaint number one. Um, this complaint, it's not about Minnesota Somali TV station endorsement. And it's not about, it's not an ethics complaint based on campaign uh, finance violation. The campaign finance violation 
um, is but one, many, one of the many factors of the lack of recording those, that information in a timely manner to be considered in determining to move forward with an investigation. It's about free advertising and a quid pro quo, which our evidence proves probable cause uh, for moving forward with a full investigation. Just to mention a couple of the key elements that come up um, and highlight in our conversation over the last two meetings. None of the evidence provided by Senator Fate disproves our claims, and I'd like to highlight just a few. The owner of the Somali TV station gave contradicting statements in the Minnesota Reformer and throughout, and throughout the affidavit about providing free services. The owner of the Somali TV should be called in to testify. Senator Fate's own statements confirm that many free ads are provided by this um, company. As mentioned, one of them, I think, again, an original uh, testimony or the original um, meeting, as well as today, that um, many stories or many ads have been produced or captured, edited, and provide free of charge by Somali TV. It was highlighted that it was under the guise of a, of a public service. Um, that is not a, an available option when you put, the campaign takes an active role. The ads did not contain the required prepared and, pre and uh, prepared and paid for disclaimer, making it very dis difficult to discern what was paid for and what was uh, provided or stated under a, a pr free community services. The statement that it was an omission um, and disclaimer, especially in today's testimony that states that Senator Vate worked with them to produce videos and that he actually had approval through the multiple iterations. And it didn't happen and wasn't missed on one, it appears it was missed on all. Senator Fate has worked with, uh, within, I believe, the Minneapolis Elections Office, ran for the House in 2018, and then in the Senate for 2020, had a contested primary while serving as his own, uh, or serving as, uh, I think, his, his own treasurer at the time, making him a real seasoned veteran. We're not talking about a first-time candidate, so somebody is very familiar with the campaign finance laws and the need to comply and report in a timely manner. The receipts provided do not clarify what the two payments were for. We've received a lot of information, a lot of conversation about those, but without the lack of an invoice, which is very uh, easily provided by the, by the company of service, um, what was purchased? Senator Fate states that the receipts were running ads, $500 each. Even if that were true, there are many different ads that were ran, and thus would lead to the claim of the quid pro quo. The cash app receipts itself um, for Omar Fate video um, and as we talked about today, it likely includes production. I think it did clarify that today um, for the production of the videos as well as um, advertising for two of the videos, not all of the others. The other statement is, and we talked about today, that the uh, many people come in to use the studio to help provide and produ produce material support in providing those ads which you claim to pay for. Um, but without an invoice, leaves a lot of questions unanswered. Senator Vate's own statements about the cash app in two separate occasions that it was a, a mistake by a campaign to, uh, that it was used in, using a personal account in lieu of the uh, campaign account, is just not believable. In, it, in itself, um, one could make a mistake, but then the continued willful omissions of the entries of campaign finance accounting for the production and the running of these ads, as well as the campaign, uh, although the amendment today, I think we got clarity on the, uh, on the on the um, in-kind component or the try and reconcile that. But the willful omission of those activities, it's one of the clear standards we have as a candidate and certainly a, a candidate running multiple campaigns. The totality of the evidence in the statements provided during the hearing for complaint one clearly shows Senator Fate with an intent to deceive and hide the free services received from the Somali TV um, by a 501c3 entity. And combine this with the Senate file 2238, uh, seeking $500,000 in funding for the Somali TV uh, is a quid pro quo. And for that charge, uh, or claim on number one, clearly provides probable cause to move forward with the full investigation. As it relates to, to uh, complaint number two, uh, the various improper conduct, conduct of uh, Senator Fate outlined in count one inconsistencies in the statement made by him and his defense of count one, you find to be... Uh, I find uh, to be untruthful, uh, gives you the basis for determining statements made by him in count two that are not truthful coincidences. Musi Muhammad's conviction for refusing to tell the grand jury where he got the ballots combined with the fact that he is uh, Senator Fate's brother-in-law, plus he works for Senator Fate's campaign, 
in addition to Dawson Kimmon, was Fate's campaign manager, long-term campaign manager, and serving uh, Senate LA, who was placed on admin leave, who later resigned. Taken as a whole, these three points give rise to a legitimate question, argument of whether the ballots or underlying election fraud came from the campaign, the Fate campaign office. Wrongful conduct, inconsistencies, coincidences, campaign violence, campaign violations involving uh, issues cited in the ethics complaint, inconsistent statements surrounding TV ads, coincidences, including Senate File 2238, Musi Mohammed and Dawson Kimmon's involvement in the Fateh campaign, when taken as a whole, support an investigation into both counts, as we've outlined in the, in the last paragraph, um, to move forward, proving probable cause, and to move forward with the full guest investigation on complaint one and two. And thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for hearing. Ms. Hendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the subcommittee, uh, with the information, with the evidence that, with the information and the evidence that it's before the subcommittee uh, today and after these two hearings, there is no probable cause to move forward on either complaint one or complaint two. Complaint one, as we've uh, previously discussed, is based um, is an allegation that's based on a false premise, a false premise that Senator Fata received free primary election campaign promotion from Somali TV of Minnesota. As we've gone over all of the last hearing and again this morning, uh, for some part of the morning, we have provided evidence that that uh, promotional consideration, those ads were in fact paid for. They were paid advertisements by Senator Fata. Senator Fata took responsibility for the fact that those ads um, had been paid out of a personal cash app instead of his uh, campaign cash app and remedied that error. But in, again, they were paid advertisements. We provided the documentation, the evidence that those advertisements were similar in form um, to the advertisements that were put on Somali TV by many other candidates on both sides of the aisle in Minnesota. Again, the allegation is that this false premise of a free campaign ad, or as actually is in one of the paragraphs of complaint one, an endorsement or a free campaign ad, the false premise is that that then led to this conflict of interest, this alleged conflict of interest and a quid pro quo when Senator Fata then later authored an appropriations bill. Again, we've shown that Somali TV was not the only um, organization that would benefit from appropriations bills authored by Senator Fata. Um, and we've also shown that there was no conflict of interest and no quid pro quo because again, he used uh, Somali TV as a provider of a service for a paid campaign ad because there is no basis for a quid pro quo because these were paid ads, there is no basis to move forward, no probable cause to move forward with complaint number one uh, that he failed to disclose a conflict of interest because again, there was no free campaign promo and subsequently no quid pro quo. As we've discussed today in complaint number two, the complaint before the subcommittee is that Senator Fata violated the, the Senate rule by failing to expressly address his involvement in the unauthorized delivery of 2020 primary election absentee ballots and retained a Senate staffer who reportedly directed the fraudulent election activity. I would argue that there is no need to look further into a transcript um, because there's no indication before the subcommittee today in any of the articles that have provided or in any of the testimony that connect Senator Fata to any sort of fraudulent activity within his campaign. There have been no allegations that have been brought against him. Clearly, if any allegations had come up, those would show up in news articles as well, and complainants would be jumping up and down with those news articles, which there are no articles, there were no allegations. So again, taking time to move forward to look at a transcript, there's a lot of pages of it. It's not, 
<laughs> it would be it would be a lot of extra reading, but it also is not important for moving forward in making a determination of probable cause in complaint number two. Because again, the complaint is that Senator Fata did not jump up and down loud enough, quickly enough, move forward. I'm getting rid of Dawson came in quickly enough. Um, according to the complainants. Again, I would argue that it is neither the norm nor the policy of the Senate to compel or dictate that senators denounce other individuals. And again, in this instance, Senator Fata did denounce the conduct um, that was alleged and ultimately convicted by Musa Muhammad in his statement. Any attempt by the Senate to do so, to try and compel that type of speech, does significantly threaten the speech rights and the integrity of the body. None of the circumstances mentioned by the complainants even suggest that Senator Fata had any individual wrongdoing. Rather, it's a blatant attempt to use the Ethics Committee to compel political speech and should be summarily dismissed. So members, um, the, uh, the direction I would like to go um, would be, I guess I'll, I'll ask first sort of to get an idea uh, what you would like to do if you would like to go to closed session now or if you would like to go grab something to eat and come back for a, a closed session or if we're not going to go to closed session, we can certainly determine that here now too. Um, my preference is, in, is to go into closed session. So that's the first question is, is, is there the desire of this, of this panel to go into a closed session to discuss this case? And I have yes, I have two yeses to my left. I have a yes to my right. So all four members agree that we should go into a closed executive session. This will be recorded. Um, then the next question is, would you like to go get a bite and, re and convene at 1.30? Or would you like to? <clears throat> would you like to go to this now? Now? Uh, I got one now. Um, I'm open. Open. Although my stomach says, <clears throat> but I'm open. I'm uh, Uncle Dave has reserves, so I, I can live with it. I'm fine. I, I have a couple reserves. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, with that, uh, I just want to make a very brief statement. Um, if this is to be considered to take, a, take the next step, which is investigation, I said this before and I'll say it again, this is not a determination of guilt, nor is it a de determination of innocence. It's to determine are there outstanding questions that this panel has to take further investigative action against. Um, if we do decide to move forward for whatever reason, this is, this. I think some people should look at this as an opportunity to clear and clear a Senate colleague, not necessarily to impugn them. Uh, because if no action is taken from that point forward, it's obvious that it did not rise to the level of violating uh, the, uh, the rule 56.3, which I will read. <clears throat> Improper conduct includes conduct that violates a rule of administrative policy of the Senate, that violates accepted norms of Senate behavior, that betrays the public trust, or tends to bring Senate, the Senate into dishonor or disrepute. Um, I, know, I know some people may think the glass is full, half full. Some may think it's half empty. My answer is I would like to make sure that I am comfortable with what we do with this, and if an investigation needs to take place, it will pay, be expedited judiciously and, ex and very quickly as far as fast as we can. If not, we may dismiss at this point in time when we come back from executive session. Seeing no further discussion, the, the chair, uh, yep, that's what I was going to do, Senator Newman. Mr. Chairman, purely uh, procedural question. Uh, would, it, would I be correct that the parties uh, will not be uh, coming back today or do you expect us to come back following your executive session. Just looking for some guidance. Um, I think um, we will determine, I think in closed session, determine if there are additional steps that need to be taken. When we come back, there would be simply motions to, because there's a couple of you that do live a bit, bit far away. Uh, I think you probably should have one of your representatives here 
uh, to, uh, and it, it won't be a situation where you'll be participating in any further debate. We've received all the information. We've listened to what you've had to say. It would be simply the panel having any final discussion and then taking f actions or dismissing or taking no action or whatever the case might be. There's a number of different options that we have in play, but we will not be taking any additional testimony. And Mr. Chairman, uh, you would be then notifying the parties of when you are going to reconvene and give us enough time uh, to come back. Yes, we point. would have we would have a game plan uh, contingent on getting information or issuing subpoenas or whatever the case might be. Um, we may have to move that timeline around a little bit, but we would have a course of action that we would announce uh, if we are going to take any further steps. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And all, mem all both sides will be apprised of the situation. We will meet right next door. Seeing no further discussion, the chair moves that we move that the uh, committee on ethics, uh, Senate ethics, move into executive session. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the motion does prevail. We are in executive session.